OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. All right, it's uh, half past seven. Uh, you might notice what colours I'm wearing this morning. Did, did that cross your mind there, Nathan? Did you see anything about my claret and blue? I had to explain it to you. You're like, what? What? You're a bit blind. Wow, well done, Jer. Unai Emery. God. Uh, look, you know, I mean, we're not getting carried away, but I'm not, not going to deny the man's a tactical genius. You're getting a little bit carried away. Well, it's good to be excited about something for a change. Why not? Why not? What a weekend. Uh, I, rather than us... Uh, fired on about it now for a while we're going to get straight into uh, this week's edition of the Gillette Labs Performance Rankings You know that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not OTBAN's Performance Rankings with Gillette I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head that performance is was just lack that intensity I'm just uh, going to jiggle open the kimono here and reveal exactly how this whole thing works. I'm I'm not involved in in the uh, in the setting of the Gillette Labs performance ranking. So, the Arsenal commenter who's already like angrily poised over your keyboard. I agree with you this time. I, I agree with you. you. You should be in them. You're not, but you should be. So, All right. Uh, where are we so, starting? So, no, 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 no. no. Put them up. Put up the performance rankings yeah. there. Then tell me who you're getting rid of for Arsenal. Uh, well, who are you getting rid of? Arsenal should be in the in the green. Who are you getting rid of? Arsenal should be in the green. Come on, who are you getting rid of? Ireland rugby. Oh, recently, Lennon, well done, well done, winning that world championship. But Arsenal won a game. Ireland rugby. So well do, do you celebrate uh, the delivery of the post? I don't think you do. Yeah. Where as a home game, we're, we're, we we win all our home games. We always do. All right, we'll no get rid of Irish rugby and put Arsenal in. Yeah, okay. I don't, I, okay, I, don't, okay. I don't mind. Yeah. I don't mind. Uh, let's start in the red. Uh, Manchester United are in the red. You can't lose to Aston Villa and not be in the red. This is Come nonsense. On. This is nonsense. Aston Villa should be in the green. Man United shouldn't even be on the thing. So why would they? What? They're not even relevant anymore. Uh, I was listening uh, to Richie yesterday give the team news uh, on off the ball and listening to the Manchester United team going, ooh, ooh, really? Cristiano Ronaldo is captain. How is Cristiano Ronaldo back as Manchester United captain? within a fortnight of basically refusing to come on the page. It seems strange, doesn't it? That whole, the handling of it now, where it was like, oh, he's a genius, he's rope doping everybody into being able to get rid of Ronaldo. It, unless this is the end, this is the, like, he's, look how bad this is. I have to burn bridges with him because uh, Ronaldo wasn't, the, he wasn't even the reason they lost, though. Like, it wasn't great, but there's loads of other problems that Man United have at the moment. Well, the second you hear Donny van de Beek is in the team, you're what was that about? a little bit concerned. Like, he hasn't started the game in God knows how long in the Premier League. Uh, particularly when Fred and McTominay were on the bench and the time Casemiro and Fred played together in the middle of midfield, it seemed to go just fine. It seemed the obvious thing to do would be bring back Fred, put him in alongside Casemiro, play Christian Eriksen as the number 10 with Bruno Fernandes out injured and keep your shape and your changes to a minimum. But bring in Donny van de Beek and maybe... I don't know, I think when you're a Manchester United manager, it's very hard to just be trying things out. Like maybe there's a bit of, as you say, with Cristiano Ronaldo. I'm just going to keep putting them out there and eventually everyone will realise I'm right and this guy is not... Yeah, I've given I think everybody chances. realised that like at the start of the season and then continuously he has blotted his copybook to the point where you don't need to do it anymore. I thought that point was like long past. I, I thought we had, then you refuse to come on the pitch and you leave the stadium and actually this is an easy break and you use him in your Europa League games and if you you know you force him to sit in the bench and he'll next time he'll take his five minutes at the end, uh, but it doesn't feel as though he's able right now to lead a Manchester United team for ninety minutes, particularly in high intensity games away from home where a match where Villa are really up for it. Yeah. New manager, stadium is hopping, uh, Garnacho's thrown in there on the left hand side didn't really, you know. <laughs> didn't really look uh, at the level, but he's eighteen. Is it? And I was, is it fair? Is it fair to put Garnacho in in that instance when there's so many doubtful parts to the rest of the team? Like, wouldn't you be better off having the full team, or a settled team, or as experienced team, or as informer team, not Van de Beek and not Ronaldo in the team when you're trying to see is this guy any good? Well, he'd obviously seen something in the Europa League game on Thursday night that he liked and decided, you know what, I'm going to stick with this group and give them a chance to prove themselves in the Premier League. But like, that has surely got to be it now for Donny van de Beek. How, how do you go back after that? It seems pretty much every manager since he's come to England doesn't really trust him, gives him an opportunity, and he doesn't grab it. Like, maybe he's just not all that. Maybe he's just not of that standard. He did a good time at an Ajax team uh, that was well-suited to his style of football. Or also that it turns out had loads of world-class players in it. You know, he might. there might be the Phil Babb beside Paul McGrath effect in Donny van de Beek's career where you look back and you go, oh, they've all gone on to win turned Champions out, League. Turned out playing Pittsburgh. in midfield alongside Frankie de Jong was you know, quite a straightforward thing. Yeah, and with like a brilliant centre-back partnership in front of you and uh, very strong wingers and good strikers. Like, 
it's easy to look good in that. Oh, he never gives the ball away. Well, that's because there's always a free man. Listen, yeah, let's be honest. The reason Manchester United are in the red is because you wanted to talk Aston Villa. Well, they're pretty good, aren't they? I mean, they were pretty good. Like They got at them early. They got their goals. Luka Dean scores a free kick. Looks like he might want to play football again. Obviously made some changes. You know, McGinn isn't in the team again. Danny Ings is coming off the bench. Ashley Young is coming off the bench. Uh, is that is that the best eleven? I don't know. Like, Dan Donker has not been in anybody's kind of uh, talk or selection or anything until about three, four weeks ago. And then all of a sudden gets in the team and now is playing really well. And... Um, Douglas Louise couldn't get in the team at the start under Stephen Gerrard and then started scoring from corners and they were like, okay, we're going to put you in the team. But I just thought Douglas Louise was their, <clears throat> was their best midfielder. And now those two side by side look relatively, well, Dundalk are slightly behind Douglas Louise. And then Jacob Ramsey, I saw a heat map of him, his stuff today. It's uh, wider and more forward. And like Ramsey's a dynamic, high intensity, very talented young player who has an eye for goal. Like, uh, if a good manager comes in, suddenly you have like loads of players. Like they have a really big squad, and if Leon Bailey's going to start scoring goals, then suddenly there's less pressure on everybody else to score goals. And like I don't know, there's not a bad squad there. So what are you thinking? Tenth? I, I mean, I just want to. I, I just want to watch them play football at the moment, which is good. Which is like a massive change after the fifth or sixth game under Stevie G. You're like, oh, what's going to happen here? It's I mean, new manager bounce, isn't it? I really, I really hope Stephen Gerrard learns how to uh, get good at uh, being a football manager. And um, but I don't know, you know, it's um, it's exciting. And then he'll start signing good players because he has like good information about one of the best leagues in the world to buy good value talented footballers from. And it's pretty exciting. He's like so you're, you're, you're charge. expecting two or three Villarreal players to come in. I, I, Will they go and invest again in January. I think so. Like Will they let Coutinho go. Well, Coutinho's injured now at least in 10 weeks, it looks like, 7 to 10 weeks. So you were hoping that maybe Coutinho might play two games now and get a loan move to some needy Champions League team who were stupid. But that's unlikely to happen, uh, given the amount of money that they've invested in his wages. But like, look, they're billionaire owners. It's his money, not mine. I don't care. Fair enough. Yeah, right. I, feel, I feel pretty good. They even brought Morgan Sanson off. Um, like, Sanson's is kind of, uh, well, he could be good. We've never seen him play. No manager's ever picked him. Why is no manager picking him? Because he might not be very good. Well, he might be good if a good manager comes in. So, <clears throat> all those, uh, this is the, the bit where it's like the first flush of a relationship and you, you don't even need to eat. You're just feasting on each other's love. That's what it feels like at the wow. moment. Wow, you're not getting carried away at all. Oh, yeah, come on, let's go. Let's, you feel alive. Feel alive on a Monday morning. Why not? You enjoy it. Yeah. All right, uh, Ralph Hasenhutl. Just one second, right? The last time Villa beat. Manchester United. Yeah. Everybody knows this now because it's been doing the rounds. But it was the famous day where Alan Hansen went on TV and then said, you can't win anything with kids. And that was the team that then went on to win the league for Manchester United that year. But the Man United team that you couldn't win anything with kids had Roy Keane and Peter Schmeichel and uh, Steve Bruce and Brian McClare and uh, still had Ryan Giggs to come back into it. Still had Eric Cantona to come back into it. Still had Andy Cole to come back into it. So Alan Hansen sitting there going, no, oh, there's no strength in that. This is ridiculous. I'm like, that's a really strong team. Is there, Hansen's, Hansen, Hansen's punditry, apart from the fact that Beckham, Scholes, the two Nevilles, and Nicky Butt turned out to be very good Premier League players, was also stupid. It was a stupid bit of punditry in and, in and of itself, irrespective of whether or not those players turned out to be serviceable Premier League players. It's a good clip, though. You should watch back. It is. It is. Maybe Alan Hansen was more controversial. He was looking for clicks. Even back then. He's getting them now. He knew. He knew. 25 but years That's on. the last time that Aston Villa beat Manchester United at Villa Park. The world is a slightly different place. You should check out the set. It's just like this blue. It's just this kind of like blue background with nothing to it. Is Lauro in with him? Uh, no, Clive Allen's in with him, actually. Oh. Yeah. And things Colin, have gone well Colin, from Clive Allen since then as well. Colin Boog's mate. Yeah. Um, let's continue with the red. Uh, Ralph Hassenhutl is still, this morning, the Southampton manager, but for how much longer? Uh, the Athletic was reporting yesterday that uh, Ralph Haston is going to be sacked. They just haven't decided whether they'll do it next week or this week. So they may sack him before they play Liverpool at the weekend, or they may just wait till that game is done, give him that match, and then sack him when everybody heads off to the World Cup. But either way, uh, he's going. Fairly, he's had a good run of it. He's been there for four years. 
which in Premier League manager terms at a club like Southampton is a is a lifetime. Uh, watched the game against Newcastle yesterday. Uh, now Newcastle were incredibly impressive again, uh, but Southampton have had too many of these sort of performances where it's very flat at home. You could tell the supporters have lost a lot of interest. Uh, you look at that Southampton team, and it feels like there's a lot of very good young players who in two or three years might all come to the fore together or might do the Southampton thing and move on to a bigger club but it's very hard to know what their best 11 is right now uh, you know who's going to score them the goals Shea Adams doesn't look like a you know, 20 goal a season striker right now and it sort of feels like it's just run out of steam at this stage you know he's had as I say four years it's always a tough gig where you got to sell your best players, whether that's you know, selling Danny Ings to Villa or Hjoiberg going off to Spurs, even someone like Matty Target going to Newcastle. Like They struggle to keep, struggle to keep their best players. In fact, Target went to Villa as well, didn't he? He did, he went yeah. to Villa between yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and Newcastle. Yeah. So when, you're, when you're losing your best players to Villa all the time, Jerry, again, it's... No, it's not, <clears throat> not a good sign. Certainly not that, that uh, version of Aston Villa. Um. So, yeah, uh, an interesting week for Ralph Hasenhutl, knowing that... Can you sack him if they go and beat Liverpool next weekend? No, you gotta you gotta do it now. The one thing is, um, they they really like him. Like they've obviously trusted him for a long period of time. Mm. I, I, did did the club change hands? Is it still the Lever family who own it who don't really like change? No, I think there's other investors in there now as well. So look, they've they're nowhere near where they were for that sort of three season spell under Poch, Cumin, even Club Puel, where they were inside the top ten in the Premier League. It's been. Yeah, every season has sort of been two seasons within one where they'll go on this run of 12, 15 games where they'll be very impressive. Like at the start of last season, they started the season really well and then it's a slow drift as the season goes on and that sort of continued on into this season. And now when you look at Southampton, you look at the team yesterday, it's not a very recognisable side at all. Aside from James Ward-Prowse still been there in the middle and Shea Adams leading the line. Like Perot's come in, Salas who's been there for a couple of years, Bella Kotchap, I know they were talking about start season, looked like a real talent, but Graham Bazunas was hammering them yesterday uh, for the defending into the game. Uh, Gavin Bazunas had a tough old time, obviously, uh, conceding a lot of goals. Yeah. I don't know how much of it you can uh, blame him for, uh, but obviously the two Irish guys that we were very excited about coming into Premier League are both conceding a hell of a lot of goals in Gavin Bazunas and Nathan Collins. Uh, at the moment, but maybe the managerial change at Wolves and the managerial change at Southampton will, will change things for them. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, okay, so uh, well, would you sack him? Oh yeah, I think it's done. It feels <clears> done. It's felt done for a while. And who's going to get it? <clears throat> Stephen Gerrard. Not a chance. Uh, they generally have a good record of finding decent managers at Southampton. Uh, they do, and I guess that was the, uh, the, the German ownership. I, you know, they were interested in having somebody that they could speak the same language to, literally metaphorically. So it'd be interesting to see if they if they go back to the same place again. Uh, all right, what's next? Uh, in the amber, uh, Ireland A, uh, the backup stars for Ireland, uh, took a heavy beating against a New Zealand 15 at the RDS on Friday night. Uh, a lot of conversation afterwards is Whoa, these guys live gone down in the way that Andy Farrell looks at them and obviously haven't done their chances of breaking through to a World Cup squad uh, any good at all a lot of it was a bit harsh and a bit of an overreaction in ways that like this was a it feels like the All Blacks are not a team you want to play in an A game like their skill set was so good like they just threw it around they played with a massive intensity and Ireland looked like a 15 who had never been on the pitch together before and had never really been on the training pitch together before they never got to the pitch of the game yeah, the only thing about that is that <clears throat> several of them had been together on the Emerging Ireland tour and, you know, some of them have been around Ireland squads and you kind of hope that there would have been some roll-on from the Ireland A experience in New Zealand when, you know, first test not so good, second test really good. So Well, maybe that would have been the case here as well if they had another uh, couple of weeks together ahead of a, a second test. Um, I just think you look at, like, the example of Jimmy O'Brien who should have been in that team. Uh, but obviously Robbie Henshaw picks up an injury uh, then O'Brien is promoted to the bench then 25 minutes into the game he's suddenly on playing against South Africa and he's brilliant and everyone's saying well now he's shown Andy Farrell that he could be part of that World Cup squad that he trusted and relied upon yet if he played on Friday night I don't think Jimmy O'Brien was going to change the result of that game in any significant way so it's such a different thing coming into an A team where you've got 14 regulars are coming into a first team see they should call it a B team uh, 14 regulars alongside you and you're at the intensity of the game straight away because you have to get to it than what we saw on Friday night. So I think as well, 
we on the outside always look at them in certain ways and you look at the result and you look at individuals. I'm sure Andy Farrell has a different way of looking at this as to what he wanted from certain players and yeah. their ability uh, Did you to do your job at the breakdown or was it, your, was it your fault that actually something specifically happened bad in that area? Did, did you make all those tackles? Did you fall off any of them? Like the, the individual second by second breakdown that they have of the player's performance you would hope will give them some comfort in some individual cases and then in others it's like, well, okay, you've got to go back and and nail down a spot, a starting spot in your um, club team, and then mm. we'll talk to you in a year's time. But and it, Maybe it's not so much about damage being done, it's about actually not forcing Andy Farrell's hand. So if you're Jacob Stockdale, and you have this wondrous performance, and you continue on your good form from the start of the season, he's going, all right, I've got to find a place for this guy in the wing against Australia in a couple of weeks' time. That probably didn't happen for too many of them. No, no. But you would hope now that we've beaten South Africa, that these games, the rest of these games don't really matter. Although Australia were sensational. I don't know if you saw any of the Australia-France uh, game. Australia were absolutely sensational. The try is unbelievable. But um, they were excellent in that first half. And they missed a few kicks, which would have put pressure on France. And then I missed the second half. But uh, France only win it in the, at the very end with another amazing try. So um, that game should be a much better uh, game when it comes to us. But uh, I guess that's the same point that I was making from a Manchester United perspective. Like when you're sticking the kid in, uh, Garnacho against Villa, is that like, would it be better? Do you now know that he's not up to it because they got beaten 3 1? Or do you think actually he's not up to it because he's playing beside Donny van de Beek? Yeah. And do you try him again alongside Bruno Fernandes? Yeah. And, you know, you keep Rashford there and maybe Marcia returns from injury at some stage and suddenly you've got everybody you want alongside him. I, I don't think they're going to be writing off Garnacho and I don't think Andy Farrell will be writing off too many of these guys either. No. OK. Uh, all right. Um, uh, Colm says there were four Irish players playing the day that um, Aston Villa beat, I've already told you one of them, that Aston Villa beat Manchester United in 1995. Name them. Oof. Uh, Paul McGrath. Andy Townsend? Yeah. Ray Houghton? Yeah. No. No? No. No Houghton. Mm. So then the other two. I already told you one. Uh, so two in the Manchester United team, Roy Keane. Yeah. And Dennis Herman. Dennis Herman, that's it. I, I just, the, the way you said it initially, it sounded like there was four, uh, four Irish Villa. players on the Villa team. No. No, Sontham was gone or wasn't, was he already gone, 95, 96? He's gone back. We can look it back. Was it, that, right. it, wasn't, it wasn't that long ago, was it? Yeah. That's the point. It's 27 years. Oh, was it 90, I thought it was earlier than that. I thought it was earlier than 95. No. No. You'll win. You'll win. Okay. No, Southampton is there. Still, but not on the team on the day. Oh, he's on the team. So it's well, five. This is a shambolic. Not on the team. This, no, no. This, is, this is like a crappy, crappy mini quiz. crappy quiz. There you go. Right, what's next? Who's in the green? In the green. Uh, the real Irish rugby team. Not Ireland, eh? Uh... So yeah, beating the world champions. What do you think of that, Razzie Erasmus? Oh, stick that in your pipe. Wah, wah, wah. Right. Have, you, have you seen his tweet? I have seen his tweet, yes. Wah. Uh, such a baby. Such a big baby. Like, uh, a historically big baby in rugby terms. I can't remember a bigger baby than Razzie Erasmus in rugby terms. And like, he's obviously a genius. He's obviously an incredible man manager. Like, really deeply understands the game. Managed to completely unify the rugby culture in South Africa like that, like really quickly, came in from a position where they were complete shambles, walked in, fixed it, won a World Cup, won a Lions series, but has done it in such a way that everybody thinks he's a big baby. Maybe there's a Jose Mourinho side of a Razzie Erasmus who can come in, makes an immediate impact, and then actually this nonsense starts to wear thin after a while, that you're in the South African squad going, listen, we got beaten fair and square, it was a cracking game, we threw absolutely everything at it, we probably tried a couple of things out that didn't really work, and listen, the big decisions even themselves out, like Colby should be sent off, it's clear as day, he should be sent off. We get away with that one, you know, there's the kick through that he's not happy about, there was you know, questions about a forward pass, they're not happy about the try that was disallowed, all of that sort of stuff but it evened itself out. You're in the dressing room going, just shut up, we're the world champions. We're the world champions. Why are we bitching and moaning like this? Take your beating. But no, uh, Razzie straight away had a go at Nick Amashukeli, uh, the referee uh, and his officials. So he's obviously already been serving a ban from uh, the previous uh, video and it seems he might be in a little bit of trouble uh, again. And uh, we shouldn't be talking about Razzie Erasmus though. We shouldn't be talking about Razzie Erasmus. We should be talking about Andy Farrell and how good Ireland were. I thought this was great. I, I saw some of the, you know, I think Neil Francis in particular was uh, hammering the quality of the game. Uh, but it just felt like it was incredibly tight, tough, intense. 
Are you ever going to have a 35-34 sort of game on Saturday night? I didn't think so. And Ireland stood up to them. And when they lost big, important players, the guys who came on, you know, whether it's Finlay Bealham, who I know everyone in Connacht has been raving about at the start of the season, came on and really brought that form into the game. Yeah. Uh, when Ty Furlong goes off and stood up in the second half, uh, Jameson Gibson Park, who hasn't been playing any rugby, is able to come on and you know. transform the fortunes of the team. He was sensational. Yeah, it'll never happen, but there was a case of watching it going, geez, actually, maybe Gibson Park for the second half of every game and uh, just upping the tempo massively. I did wonder if that was part of the thinking as well, like putting Murray in at the start. Because it, like, it looked like Murray had kind of slipped in the pecking order to third, but then they picked Craig Casey as captain, and so they gave him a start to see exactly how that would go on the A team. And then when Gibson Park came on, it was funny because we had talked with Brian O'Driscoll the previous week about the Leinster Munster game and he just had been comparing the metres made uh, by the respective scrum halves and how Leinster had had a scrum half who was willing to make a break and uh, Luke McGrath and had made like 70 odd metres but there was nothing coming from uh, from Murray and then Murray's last act the one in which he gets injured is actually a break and you're like wow this is great because all of a sudden it just transforms what South Africa are thinking they're like oh hang on you, you will do this to us and then in the second half obviously it's completely different just the speed of which, uh, which Gibson Park passes the ball, and the, the like, even the runs that players are making off him. Um, that I was I was up behind. I don't know the names of the state the stands in Lansdowne Road, but I was behind no, the it's goal. It's almost as if we should name the stands after some famous historical figures who contributed an enormous amount to Irish sport. What do you know the names of the stands? The North Stand, the South Stand, the East Stand, the West Stand. Is that it? Well, what's the big one behind the goal, not the little one? I oh, the, the big the big one. Okay, I was in the big one up high, and it was actually there were brilliant seats because everything happened in the second half right in front of us. And um, after an Irish boot kicks the ball through in the, uh, we cheated to to score the try, which I didn't know until Razzy helpfully pointed out. Thanks, Razzy. It's normally people cheat us, so we're very proud of that. You know, um, well, what a brilliant try it was! Like an amazing piece of skill from Caelan Doris, and then everything that happens the rest of the way through is sensational. But you could actually see from where we were sitting that. It's on, it's on. Once Gibson Park makes his, his break, it's such a different... Um, it was kind of slightly lower in the ground when Michael Obafemi scored his goal uh, in the previous game. Who was that against? Um, uh, Scotland? No. In... Just, just, just re- the most recent November. God, how, how can I not remember this thing that just happened right there? <laughs> you were commentating on it. <laughs> anyway, I was fairly similar. You could see if Obafemi just shoots and then he, he just does exactly what he's supposed to do and pings it straight in the corner... And you can see if Ireland just passed this ball properly, they've got an overlap and they've got to go in in the corner. But it's all kind of happening in slow motion, even though it's happening at a million miles an hour. So they're, the Armenia. The Armenia, the Armenia game, sorry. Um, absolutely brilliant uh, seats and brilliant fan experience as well, I have to say, because the fans have been taking it in the neck about like, oh, you're not paying any attention what's going on. Fans don't pay attention when the game is shit. I think everybody has to like cotton on to this. When the game is good, when it's the All Blacks or when it's England or when it's nip and tuck against Wales, Fans are going to stay in their seat and they're not going to be off going to have a piss or to drink pints. But when Ireland are absolutely well, killing somebody... Well, everyone in every other sport. When Ireland are killing somebody, they're not going to go off and get drinks and have pints and go for pisses. Or when it's a massive game, when it's the All Blacks, when it's England, when it's France, when it's the Springboks, nobody during the game was getting up around us. There was no complaints, apart from maybe the music, which was so weird. But, um, so explain, I was reading this online, they're pl- every time there's a break in play now, they're playing music. Well, which I presume again at the Aviva, which is the loudest sound system in the world, overpowers everything. Well, in fairness to them, they pause and they wait and see if there's going to be a song. And then there's no song and they play music. And the music was everything from Black Eyed Peas. Tonight's going to be a good, good night. Oh uh, yeah, uh, always a, a great song in the history of Irish sport. I'm like, lads. I mean, know a little bit of history here. Just know a little tiny bit of history. Don't play the Black Eyed Peas, right? Play it, well, any, maybe, maybe play Black Eyed Peas Weekend. I don't know. Um, but they played that and they played Bruce Springsteen was the first one. I was like, I mean, I, I know Bruce is very, uh, likes Ireland because he makes loads of money here. But is it, is it Irish? Is there but, something specific? But why are you playing music anyway? Like the break in play is when you sit and you have a chat with the person beside you about the thing that just happened well, that caused the break in play. It's rugby. It takes two hours now. It was two hours and three minutes. Oh, I know it was two hours and three minutes. Yeah. But like, So I think 
I, I actually don't think it's that bad an idea because there was definitely a period, there was a period where uh, there was a scrum called and there were two injuries and the injuries were just taking absolutely ages and everybody was starting to have a chat and kind of going, what's happening? What, how do we get here again? What's the well, story? What's, what, what, what is the music doing? Is everyone getting on their feet singing Bruce Springsteen going, yes, now I'm invigorated? Well, there was one that started a bit of karaoke, which I've never forgotten. That, and the people were starting to sing a little bit to it. So that's what they're trying to do. They want a little bit what of karaoke is this? going on. What is Like Ireland are playing South Africa, the world champions, and you're wanting a little bit of karaoke, yeah. and you're praising people for sitting and watching the match. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I, I'm not praising people for sitting and watching the match. I'm saying stop giving out about people going for pints when the match is not in the balance. Like, stop having this expectation that people should be, like, stuck in their seat for two hours. Like, that, I thought that it was, it was crazy complaining about that last week, to be honest. So anyway, the match that. itself, Ireland played really well. South Africa played very well. There were some mistakes. They're out half, not very good at out half, it turns out. And um, we'll get into this a bit more detail with Quinny. We might try and get some South African reaction on the show tomorrow. That's a good idea that I've just come up with. Yeah, there you go. You can, you can stick that one on the agenda. Um, and You're getting carried away, Jer. Well, I... I, I getting carried away. A year think, away from the World Cup. I think we shouldn't get, lessons. shouldn't get carried away. I think that the South African team that we face in a year's time will be different. They'll have a number 10 who kicks their goals at 100% more than likely. As well, opposed they don't. To, well, they probably will. They've got two other number 10s and they won't be picking a 15 at 10 and they won't be picking a, an 11 at 15. And so all of a sudden, they'll just be a better team. I'm, I'm predicting that they'll be a slightly better team. I think we could be a better team too. I don't think well, we're that, finished. That, that's the, the, the one thing of South Africa will be a better team. Like Every team is going to have injuries when the World Cup comes around. We don't know what position. We do have a way of looking at going, oh, but if Sexton was injured. Well, like Other teams will have injuries as well to key players during this. Yeah, Sexton might be, Sexton and Gibson Park might be um, very, 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 very important to us. Ireland are a completely different team when Sexton plays. So now I would actually stop playing Sexton. I would stop starting. You would have stopped playing Sexton three years ago. Well, I, I, well, you have to now, right? You have yeah, to bring you, him off the bench. You see, I always think the conversation pre a run of games is, well, we play Sexton in the first one, then obviously we rest him. And then what will happen is the week of the Australia game, there'll be no question that like, Sexton's going to start against Australia. You would think so. Do you think in the long run that's the right decision? No, I don't. I, I, don't. I think it's, it's a very hard decision to drop him when he's playing as well as he is. So don't drop him. Put but him also, on the bench. Do, you, do you really learn a lot that is relevant to... like What does Joey Carberry do against Australia that gets him a start... Like, you're just giving him a start for the sake of giving him a start. He hasn't earned a start. He hasn't done anything near enough to get near pushing Sexton out. So he do, comes in, does grand against Australia. Are you starting him in the Six Nations? Yeah. I ha- so you're sort I, of making him it, the de facto number 10, even though he's not going to be that at the World Cup, just so he's got enough game time under his belt. So with that, if he does become the number 10, which historically has happened, historically, we've seen injuries to Sexton over, like, specifically a four or five game period, Sexton gets injured and misses a game or two. And so if those game or two happen to be a quarter final, then you've got nobody who has any experience. But he doesn't, lately he doesn't, like Sexton, now every uh, hit he takes feels like it's twice the ferocity of anybody else taking it. And you look at him and go, he's definitely coming off now. And then two minutes later, he's running the show once again. But for Carberry, as much as it's, like Troy Carberry's vastly experienced. It's what, six years since Chicago at yeah. this stage? So, you know, he has all the experience he needs in some ways. Is it not a mentality thing? And you can't change that because no matter what happens, you're the backup, Joey. So you can't give him the jersey against Australia go, go, show me that we should replace Johnny Sexton with you because no matter what he does, he's not getting that jersey off Johnny Sexton between now and the World Cup. So he needs to have a mindset actually of, I need to be able to come in at short notice and I need to be able to finish off games if Sexton goes off injured. Yeah, that, well, that's certainly one thing. But what if Sexton gets injured? Like, and then he does have to start those games. So Absolutely, like, but I don't, I don't know if there's anything that happens over the next year that changes his performance in a year's time if that happens. Um, I think that playing a, like five or six big games and starting five or six big games would be hugely important. Possibly, but... Is it, I'm, I'm looking at um, footage from the 2021 Guinness Six Nations. It says... Uh, it's in a, an empty stadium, in an empty Aviva in 2021. Is that, is, that, is that correct? Yeah, that'll be right. Yeah, this year's Six Nations, the crowds were back. Uh, Ireland played France that day, right? Um, yeah. Who started at number 10? Uh, oh, Ross Byrne? Billy Burns. Billy Burns! This can't be 2021, is it? Billy Burns, good man, Billy. Yeah. That seems like 2020. So anyway. So well, no, 2020, you might remember, didn't happen. At all. Okay. Well, they were. Remember the Italy game was the first sign that. Hmm, that seems a bit weird. Why, why would you call off that? 
Uh, anyway, look, my point is give give somebody game time. If if it's not him, it, give Frawley three games to start with Sexton on the bench. And I don't just mean Italy and I don't just mean Scotland. Are you mean, starting Carberry this this weekend? Uh, I guess so, yeah. Or maybe you start Frawley this weekend and Carberry's on the bench for that. And then the last one you start Carberry and Sexton's on the bench. Crowley? I don't think so at this stage. I think he's got to displace... Carberry in Munster I feel like we're still going to be having this exact conversation we are we are uh, just one last thing over the last couple of weeks I've been making the point that if you watch NFL you've seen Aaron Rodgers fall off a cliff and you've seen Tom Brady fall off a cliff and yesterday Aaron Rodgers in the first half alone threw three interceptions which is like the first time in his career that he's thrown two red zone interceptions in the same game and it was against the worst ranked defence uh, in the entire NFL and they lost a fourth game in a row and I think it's the first four game losing streak where he's been fit and starting all his games and it's like ah oh, this is his career's gone down in flames and then it was Tom Brady's turn late in the evening and what happened in the last 44 seconds with no timeouts Tom Brady beat the defending Super Bowl champions with an absolutely sensational return to form and you're like good man Tom Brady maybe Johnny Sexton can take us to the World Cup this is going to be amazing yeah. that would be almost more of a concern or as much of a concern that when Ireland get together next August and they start those warm up games that suddenly you're like wait a second this is Johnny Sexton who hasn't played for four months and has taken the summer off is now struggling to get back to where we saw him last year and that cliff edge has come and it's by then it's definitely too late to do anything because you still have to play him he's fit so you have to play him even if he's not playing well uh, but that does have that happening Jack Cosgrove says OTB to apologise over the alleged kick clash at the Aviva I mean what was it like there? I mean, well, I know the team on this side is Ireland because it's got all the Ireland players in it. Another team on that side, well, they've got even Etzebeth and he's like the giganticest human being you've ever seen, except for his uh, second row partner who's slightly bigger. Um, was it Lou Dieger is, is bigger? But they were big, 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 big men. Could we not just play in white? We used to have a cool white jersey. It was great. Oh, There's no such thing as a cool white jersey. There is. The Kildare jersey, the Real Madrid jersey and the Ireland away jersey. Cool white jerseys. No, I'm not sure. Uh, now, the k- kick clash, watching it on TV, I thought it was difficult at times. Again, you, you know what's happening because one team attacks this way and the other team attacks this way. So it's not like quite like soccer where they're totally mixed up uh, the whole time. But it was still way too close. When the ball was over on the far side of the pitch, you're looking going, is that... Yeah, yeah who, who's, who's leaping there? Is that one of... Is that, yeah. Um, uh, t- like, when the Josh van der Fleer try went down... By the way, Josh van der Fleer's handling in that moment of like, OK, I know exactly where my feet are, I know where the try line is. Yeah, got it down as the rest of the whole mall. It was amazing defence from South Africa. In the stadium, you, screens are very small in the stadium. Like, if you're the... If you're the, the level of moaning out of people who go to rugby matches you're the, is if, getting to insufferable. You're and you're the, watching the, the big screen. The giant screens, screens like, aren't big enough for you now. They really aren't. Oh, and you had to get off your seat for your pint. No, you didn't. I, I mean... Well, you, did you get off your... Did you get pints delivered to your seat? You don't get pints delivered to your seat, no. It's bring a hip flask. It's fairly obvious. There's an obvious solution to all of these problems. Wow. Dave Cos says the overhyping of the Irish team will be terrible. Security. I mean, is, is there... Is it... Oh, look, are you, you, I, uh, in a way, I think we've gone reverse now where every conversation... like Think of the last year. They've won a Twickenham. They've won down in New Zealand. They've just beaten the world champions. Like, you'd be, uh, it'd be acceptable to lose the run of yourself here and say Ireland are the best team in the world right now. France, France are the best team in the but world. The, the, but they have to go beat France. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be France. Uh, Robert Gamble says, Leeds United jersey, best white jersey in Christendom. Um, See, I don't mind a home jersey that is white, but any Ireland away jersey, whether it's rugby or football, that is white, I'm not getting on board with. Why? I just think they, they don't like the look of them. In Italian 90? It's fine. That's great. Jer- but I think both those jer- the green jerseys. Is this your anti-English stuff coming in? Is, that, is this like a slight green tinge? Is that what's happening here? No, absolutely not. I just oh, okay. No, you love England. Uh, Darrow Tool says Cardi is the next best out half. <laughs> Cardi is the next best out half after sex in Ireland. Says uh, Darrow Tool, he might be, but he's not getting in. Like no. so, he hasn't got a sniff. Uh, Carby's more injury prone than Sexton says Mr Quinnis the logic to play him over Sexton doesn't add up in fairness um, he would definitely need a run of games if he doesn't get injured uh, Chris Gall says morning lads watching the Villa yesterday weird what a good manager can do with good players uh, Mark Dunning says not enough green to go around this weekend but Aidan O'Brien's performance at the Breeders' Cup deserves to be in the green um, 
I hope the Jets are in the green jar. NFL great this year, says Shifty Lad. Yeah, they beat the Bills last night with a, a comeback performance where it looked like they were going to get torn apart in the first half and then were excellent afterwards. Um, and then we've got questions for Alan Quinlan coming in. We'll get to those in a moment. Who is that? Oh, one more green. One more green, yes. Uh, Reese McLennan, uh, we've got to mention. Uh, world champion, uh, Ireland's first ever world champion in gymnastics, won over the weekend in Liverpool, uh, has had a very difficult couple of years, uh, was hugely frustrated with his performance at the Olympics where he made one big mistake and that cost him a chance of a medal. You know, He went uh, to Tokyo with a real expectation of meddling and it didn't happen for him. Uh, he didn't take the gold at the Commonwealth Games, at the European Championships and... So he went into the World Championships, as always, with some expectation, but I think probably with uh, a lot of nerves as well, uh, because he hadn't been able to deliver on the big occasions recently. Uh, but he delivered big time over the weekend and got the World Championships. I don't know if you saw his uh, interview after. It was very, very emotional. Uh, you could tell what it meant to him. Still just 23 as well, Reese McLenaghan. Uh, so well done, Reese. Yeah, there's, um, I hope this is like the bang of Parry Carrington where it's like you're always not quite sure if he's going to make it to the level you think he's really going to be able to make it and then there's just this mad explosion of like, no, I made it, I can do it now. Yeah, and the great thing, uh, the great thing, but uh, the fact that the Olympics are so close together, we're now just 18 months away from Paris. It's going to come around very, very quickly. So the buzz off this and the momentum that he has should carry him through. All right. If you want to get in touch with us this morning, 087-9180-180 is the WhatsApp number. That's this week's edition of the Gillette Labs Performance Rankings. OTBAN's Performance Rankings with Gillette. Right, a reminder that Brayburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of OTB. Each week we're giving one lucky viewer a €100 Euro voucher to spend on some Brayburn Coffee goodness at an Apple Green store near you. To enter, check out at Off The Ball on Twitter, like and retweet our Brayburn competition post and you'll be in the draw. Brayburn Coffee never compromises on quality or taste to give you the best on-the-go coffee experience on the road. It's available at Apple Green today. Now, we're on Ashling O'Reilly and Brent Pope covered that Ireland win for off the ball on Saturday evening at the Aviva. Here's Brent talking with Ashling afterwards about a tough, tough victory. Take a look. And I thought Fords all stood up. You know, you could not you could put a blanket over them defensively, and I thought that really stood to them the whole game. Even in the back line, they defensively. A guy like Jimmy O'Brien comes on for his first cap. You know, he looked to the man and born, didn't he? You know, the first thing he had to do was get out a kick out under pressure. He did it in a relaxed sort of like he'd been there for years. And uh, I thought he had a magnificent uh, game when he came on. Yeah, to come on here at a packed out of Eva Stadium against South Africa, you know, the world champions, you know, what a debut for him. And he really did step up. Yeah, well, I think that's the, that's the, the impressive thing about today for me. It was a squad win. When you look at guys that come on, like Fidley beat him. When you look at McCloskey, who was playing really well too, who went off. I mean, it wasn't a disjointed performance. Everybody seemed to sort of file seamlessly into the task what Ireland recruited for them. And that's what you need looking forward to the next World Cup. You need players to be able to come in at any stage of the game. Like O'Brien was playing out of position, essentially. I mean, I don't know when the last time he played centre for a protracted period of time. But, I mean, players shifted around and they just seemed to be able to fit into the way that Ireland were playing the game. Ireland always looked the more creative side, I'd have to say. I don't think South Africa brought much in the way of back play, but they brought this physicality we know they could bring. So that's still a that's still an ask for the next World Cup because they'll get better in that regard. But, I mean, the way that Ireland stood up, as say, defensive in the first half and then kind of increased that creativity in the second half, you know, was, was, was brilliant. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? I'm sure you've seen the film Raging Bull. Mm. I love talking about this from it, but there are several times that you see things from the perspective of the boxer, played, you know, Jake DeMotta, played by Robert De Niro, and you see it in slow motion. And for the truly great sportsman, sports person, Neymar is in this category. Things are happening in slow motion. Neymar can push the ball between your legs because he just sees things. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. Nine minutes past eight. Alan Quinlan is with us. Alan, good morning to you. How are you? That's how are you? Nathan is a, a football man, right? That's his main sport. But for once, he's made a very, very good point about rugby. And I think wow. he, he, it's like what's rare is Compliment. wonderful. What's rare is wonderful, Alan. He was making the point, Jimmy O'Brien was supposed to play for the A-team and if he'd played in the A-team, everybody would have been going, geez, Jimmy's not great, is he? And then all of a sudden he gets catapulted into the senior team and everyone's going, wow, Jimmy's amazing. So, very hard to take it's, too it's much from the A-team performances on and an individual. Uh, great point. Uh, it is, yeah. And and maybe Friday night like was a tough night for him and, and 
probably on reflection afterwards when I watched the game back on, on Saturday morning it was a tough night for him for a number of reasons obviously physically um, they were they lost the battle in, in the collisions the breakdown stuff like that and then they played a side who all their players in New Zealand they're all playing Super Rugby they're all starting in their Super Rugby teams a lot of some of these the Irish players are not starting when everyone's available no. in their provinces. You made a great point pre-game, I think, about um, the chippiness of certain players getting selected for the A team. In your day, traditionally, everybody would have been like, "Why well, should be in the senior team?" Bit of bitterness, yeah. Yeah, with, yeah. with the All Blacks, there's like it, a lot of different. those players. It's different for the Irish players. They're like, "Oh, this is my chance to see what it's all about." And so. it's a bit different, Jerry, <clears throat> now because they're they're it's Team Ireland. They're all together. They're training together. Back traditionally, we would have been completely separate. We would have been given out uh, about the hotels we were in, <laughs> the, the travel we would have had to do, um, all that stuff. Great night, Friday night after you play the A game yeah. and then you go to the international if you're away in France or in in, the, in England or wherever. But, um, yeah, it was a learning curve for them. It doesn't necessarily make them bad players because a lot of them, you know, it, it was their opportunity. And maybe I was a little bit negative uh, I don't know, I, I kind of thought about it afterwards was I've been a bit harsh on them. It wasn't really, you know, you're not judging players individually. I think collectively they were all off a little bit and it was something that they really need to understand. It's no harm like no, that, it's that not, happens no. to them in that kind uh, of game. Like, is, is, is the understanding that they're thrown together and it's very, like, Ireland is so system-based and knowing what your exact role is all the time and those alongside you, that if, if everything isn't in place, it can fall apart quite easily. Well, I, I put it this way, Nathan, if they played again this week, it, you'd get a reaction, mm. you'd get a much more uh, energetic type um, alertness around the breakdown, around some of the New Zealand players, their strengths and stuff like that. I would imagine it would have been a really kind of positive week being in with the seniors and Andy Farrell and the other coaches training them. And maybe they just mentally expected it to happen, being at home in the RDS. Um, I'm sure they were very conscious and aware. I'm not saying they weren't conscious and aware of when you're playing New Zealand. New Ze any sort of New Zealand team can do that to you at any stage. You know, um, in the ITM Cup, if you brought one of those teams up, Super Rugby, they can cut you apart when they get on the front foot. So I just think they lost kind of early collisions, the way the game started, and it just kind of petered out for them. And they saw vulnerability. They saw a little bit of uh, fragility in the, in the Ireland defensive setup. Um, because there's some very good players. You pick someone like Nick Timoney and, and, and um, Gavin Coombs, Key and Prendergast, the back row, obviously where I played, could those guys play for the national team? Of course they can. You know, Nick Timoney's been in and around the squad, brilliant for Ulster. You know, you see him up against big South African teams, he, st he stands out, he's physical, brilliant ball carrier. They were all just quiet, so collectively they were all off it a little bit, um, particularly up front. And when you see an, a, a team that's getting counter Dave Heffernan took a quick penalty at one stage, in, in the second half and within that that first action that rock was a turnover five yards out you don't see that that's like should never happen against anyone because all the forwards are so close together it just summed up um, a bit of kind of aggression that was needed there but they learn from it and it doesn't mean you know it, Andy Farrell said himself a bit of a harsh lesson for them they learn from that that you need to be kind of emotionally right up for these games I've just never trusted these games since Matt Letizia got that hat-trick for England uh, before the World Cup in 98 and they still didn't pick him in the squad. So it was pointless. It was absolutely pointless. <clears throat> but there's obviously a, a much greater plan in place here when you look at going to New Zealand and playing the two games against the Maoris, having an emerging Ireland team, having the A yeah, game on Friday night. Definitely. That as much as performance and they want the result, that actually Farrell sees a huge benefit of having these guys in, learning off him, Paul O'Connell, off the senior management team. Yeah, and I've always said this before, like when you're in training with the Irish squad and you see, um, it's the same even in the provinces when young players get called up from the academy and they see kind of the way guys go about their business, the way they do their, their weight sessions, their fitness stuff, uh, the nutrition, all that kind of stuff is sometimes, it, it's, a, it is, it's a really important learning part for young players. And for players being in around the squad, I think... Um, very positive end to the tour in New Zealand with the with the second string uh, winning against the Maoris after a really tough start and Friday night was kind of like the first Maori game probably a little bit more ruthless from the, that New Zealand side but 
that first Maori game was there was a you know they were kind of blown away a little bit. Great reaction to win in the in the second one. Emerging Ireland really positive. So it's a bit of a learning curve for him. And um, well, he has strength and depth. Uh, um, David Nusifor, who in fairness has had a lot of criticism on this show, uh, has has spoken about what you know do do the same thing, expect the same results, do something different, trying like. And we've said it, Ger, haven't we? You know, after the last World Cup, what what can we do different? What can Ireland do? Well, they've done something. Do we need to pick overseas players. Do we need to? Yeah. There was talks at one stage about a, a fifth province. I mean, I still think they should buy London Irish. It's a uh, it, it probably get it. Pennies in the dollar at the moment, you know. Yeah. Anyway, but I, that's that's not going to happen. Uh, and this stuff is different, and it's great. And um, you know, the provinces weren't happy with the emerging Ireland thing. Munster were probably the hardest hit, yeah. Given that they needed those guys, and, and with a lot of injuries they had. But you know, if we're talking after World Cup next year and say, well, why didn't we get past the quarter final? They were kind of shaking the tree a little bit, looking for different things to do here. Yeah, and they have to be commended for that. And even what happened on Friday night will be very beneficial. When you, when you think about it afterwards, it'll be very beneficial for some of those players, really kind of for them mentally to know, because techni- of course, technically, you know, the New Zealanders had a lot of X factor. Sean Stevenson, the wing, sensational player. Ruben Love at full back, he's only 21. He's been cutting it up for yeah. the Hurricanes as well. So when they got on the front foot, they were Alan's lethal. Alan's nephew looks like a yeah, player AJ too. Yeah, AJ Lamb. They were lethal. Um, let's talk about the, the main team, right? Because... Um, the performance was a completely different performance from some of the other performances that we've seen from Ireland and there's been this kind of uh, residual issue where we're terrified of the big physical teams. Leinster repeatedly coming up against big physical teams, Saracens, uh, La Rochelle, Saracens, La Rochelle, uh, Ireland, Manitoulagi, the ghosts from um, various times that he's come up, the Vinopolas, uh, and this was the biggest test that we can possibly have. This is an even bigger team where everybody is absolutely massive apart from um, the wingers and we stood up to them. Now that's like the single most important thing that yeah, happened. And I think it's um, it's what we needed. I think it was really important. We needed that bit of a dogfight as well because, um, you know, if you go back five years ago, Ireland won 38-3, we, we, were, we were flying at 17, 18 was a brilliant year. And then, um, you know, we, we, we're getting asked hard questions now and we're answering them. And I think the, the resilience, the character, and this is a backup of, this gives them more of a foundation to say that, you know, even what happened in New Zealand was, we're, we're up there now, we're able to mix it at the moment. Of course, we want it to happen at the World Cup. We, we, we need a big performance if we get to a, if we get to a quarterfinal yeah. um, against... You know, New Zealand or France, we we need that big performance. Then, we need it in, in at that moment. So, but I think Johnny Sexton made a very good point. You don't get you for certain players, they don't get opportunities. It can change very very quickly for Ireland, and it's you have to win, and it's great to win these big matches. So I think um, the physical side of it, and given you're missing at Henshaw and Aki, who are really really physical for Ireland, um, very important for them. Jimmy O'Brien was was unbelievable when he came on, um, and it's not alone South Africa's uh, strength and size; it's their power. I think they're very explosive. Um, we got a different test when Fury came on and and Quagga Smith. We now had t- two fetchers against us, and they got a couple of turnovers in the end. So, um, really stressed. I think Finley Beelam was was outstanding um, up against Kitsoff. Um, the way he scrummed, he got caught at one scrum penalty against him, but he won two. Yeah, yeah, he, he won two penalties there as well. Um, so, you know, Furlong. We've always said if Furlong isn't on the team, we're screwed. Uh, but actually, we're not anymore. I mean, obviously, you won. He's still a massive yeah. loss. Yeah. He's still a massive know, like, loss because it's, it's, not, it's he's playing around the field as well. The way he wraps guys up and tackles and and impact tackles as well, Furlong. But. Um, you know, down to the bare bones a little bit. You know, we we need to get Henderson back as well. He'll give a little bit more depth in 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 that second row. It felt like that's why Ronan it was so Keller. impressive that it was it was World Cup esque in a way that, that we're talking about winning the quarter final. You want to win the semi final final. You're not going to have three, four other worldly performances. Sometimes you just got to grind it out in a tough game while you're missing a few players. Yeah, I just thought the way they they dug in there and they stopped their mall, and Nathan was really impressive. It's at times it was just wave after wave of 
these pods of runners coming around the corner and um, they're so direct and so physical that, you know, Ireland were hanging on there. They're, they were sore boys, I'd say, on Sunday morning because um, they're very effective at that. And then Dialende at 12, um, Jesse Creel, they're very powerful players as well. Dialende had a man, he had a little bit of a... And then yeah, you see Dialende running into him. But then he kind of I thought Gary Ringros was was he showed his leadership qualities. You know when when uh, McCluskey went off, he went in at twelve. He's carrying, he's tackling, he's decision making when to give the pass, when not to give the pass. He he was absolutely brilliant as well. You know I gave man of the match to Josh Van der Fleer. It could have been James Ryan. It could have been Caelan Doris. It could have been Gary Ringros. Um, Hugo Keenan was brilliant. Could have been James and Gibson Park. Yeah, when he came on, yeah, he was sensational. But I just thought it was so traditional up front. I think it had to go to forward. I Fair think Van yeah. I mean, der Fleer getting the try. Uh, um, the way he, even without the ball, um, you know, he made, he was the top tackler on the team. But he also, you know, supported so many guys carrying the ball into the ruck. Was first player there cleaning out the ruck. His entry points in the ruck. What changed for Ireland in the second half was their speed of delivery. I think seventy. Something percent, I can't remember the exact figure. I saw this graphic coming up on the screen. Um, their breakdown was was less than three seconds. Right. And then you have Gibson Park just yeah. springing around the place. And they asked some questions. Obviously, to try, a little bit contentious there, talks of maybe, was, was it forward from Andrew Porter? Well, there's Finley there's... Bielham is standing with his back towards the South African line. It's the foot in the it's... rock that Razzie is bitching about. He's he he's uh, correct. He's correct. He is yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah, because Mustard um, <laughs> South Africa got <laughs> pinged for one of them. But yeah, but like, do you think Colby should have been sent off? I thought he should have been sent off. I thought it was no. I didn't think he was. Did he been protect him? Um, I thought um, the force into the ground wasn't what it, what it what would require a red card. What would give you a red card? I thought Matt, Matt Hansen was able to put his arm out as well. But he did come down kind of... It was very reckless and dangerous. Could have been a red card, Nathan. Could have been. But if you ask me now and at that point, should this guy get a red card? I would say no. i say yellow. Uh, Peter Steff de Toit could have went with him. He could have given two yellows. So there's three things could have happened. Two other things could have happened. It could have been two yellows or it could have been a red for Colby. And yeah. they wouldn't have... <clears throat> you wouldn't be much argument about it afterwards well Razzie likes to argue that's his shtick he's got a do you know what Razzie does he actually says what we f- what all of us feel when we watch a game oh Ireland should have had a penalty there or that scrum should have went it differently or in soccer that wasn't an offside or VAR got that wrong do you know where we have a chat amongst yeah. each other Razzie as director of rugby he kind of lets it out into the public that which coaches don't do he, uh, coaches in all sport are furious after the game. It takes time for them to calm down and they have to go BPC. Sure, yeah. But then calmly, Razzie takes it to social media hours later and is like, well, I'm just going to put the bomb out there and see what happens. Part of me loves it. <laughs> well, the only thing is, right, if, if, if you do it, you have to take the consequences of it. So what he's doing is eroding the confidence that the public has in the referee. He's, he's, it's wild conspiracy. It's Donald Trump. That's what this is. Yeah. It's eroding people's uh, belief in the systems and that the we... the reality is now, you're not going to get... Like, all the referees are, have obviously would have spoken about what happened on the lines, and this one will come up again. And it's that 50-50 call that you might want in a big game. He's trying to put pressure there, yeah, for sure. It's clearly designed to influence future refereeing decisions. This isn't just whining to show what a great lad to the South African fans he is it's clearly designed to influence future refereeing decisions and if that's if that's the rules of engagement then that's fine but it's going to happen right across the board unless World Rugby comes and says we told you don't do this again we banned you for six months you've done it again you can't come you're banned again like does, does it have any difference in influence though than yes. Joe Schmidt going to World Rugby as he would say after every Ireland game where he'd have their own report on the referees? But you're allowed to do that. I, know, yeah. I, I understand, but that gets back to the referees. That There's an understanding Ireland, of Ireland the will, questions will, and the pressure. Ireland will, will um, have a number of things on Saturday that they will report back. So that, that happens standard. Um, I think when it comes out in the public, you're, you're also giving the fans a bit more... 
um, fuel to start kind of barking on social media as well. Look, there's a South African guy who's making videos at the weekend. Again, he does it after loads of games. The, the uh, guy who's not Razzie. Yeah, well, I think it, it came on so quickly after the game. There was no way Razzie could have made that those oh. videos. But, you know, you can pick out loads of things in rugby. Side entries are the, are the uh, biggest one. And they're showing they're not going to go quietly at the World Cup. Like, there's no way Razzie Rasmus is taking a World Cup defeat no, next year look, quietly. No, um, that's that's what he's doing and uh, as I said part of me loves the fact that he highlighted something here that was I, I couldn't see it in commentary because we don't give it's afterwards that picture comes up not not while we're on comms but Dan Sheehan did kick the ball out of the breakdown um, and they got pinned for one that was probably more clearer and there wasn't as many Yeah, I don't know where the referee was standing for the, that one but the next one was was clearly kicked out of the breakdown and penalised yeah yeah if you're a coach, Ger, I'll ask you, if you're a coach and you see that yourself, though, what are you feeling? Well, what I feel is different from what I tell everybody okay. publicly. What I tell so, everybody publicly is course, like, yeah. and what the message to your team is. We got That's the point. Some coaches, most coaches come out and they have to bite their lip. And the other thing is, right, do I have a track record of, like, leaking? It was brilliant, though, the video. <laughs> like, an hour-long video where... I'm not saying it's right, but it was brilliant. And like so, so you think still his players are on side with what he's doing? They're like, yeah, okay. they they believe in him, and uh, I think that they, Who you know, the, the South they have a very very tight, uh, seem to be a very tight uh, knit bunch. You go back, honestly, being in South Africa in 2016, and what we did to him in 2017, they were in turmoil, and a lot of really good players in the field, badly coached, I think, and with respect to Alistair Kutsia who was very nice to us on that tour when we were there in 2016. I was there for Sky and I was doing the commentary. He was very welcoming as the opposition manager to the media and stuff. Um, they were in a tough place. They were in a difficult place. They weren't organised. And what Rassi Erasmus and Jack Nienenberg have done, they have just seemed to have a swagger about them. They're so well coached. Um, their yeah. pressure on the opposition, their kick chase, the type of players that they're getting to developing. Um you know, they've done a brilliant job there. So they were on it on, at the weekend. They really wanted to win in Dublin to make a statement. Um, and I think that's the impressive part. Ireland were under so much pressure at times. Um, they had a long, long periods in the Ireland half and on, on in the first half of the game. And Ireland kind of stood up to that. At full time, Willie LaRue was going absolutely crazy with, with the referee. Which he does. And he, and he, he, I just thought that... I saw him do some of that stuff in the rugby championship. He's he does a lot of wind in Villarreal. He made a big difference when when he came on. He looked very very dangerous. Um, the game was opened up a little bit, and they were really throwing caution to the wind. And it sometimes it 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 is you have to ask the question if South Africa kind of played like they did when they're chasing the game, and this is re the real intrigue. Would they put 20, 30 points on teams? You know, if they start like that... We had Joel Stransky on Friday night talking about how everybody in South Africa is dying to see what happens with uh, Willems at, at 10 because it's going to be a different game. It's somebody who's like really keen to get the ball out. He played really badly, I thought. Uh, you know, was under pressure, kept getting blocked down, missed kicks. Um, if if they they were talking about... Uh, so that their 13 is, is injured at the moment and not playing, who they think... Lucano Wam, yeah, who's a wonderful player. He's they a, have Matty, Matty Libok Le then the Stormers fly half as well and there's... There's people calling for him to come in there. So it'll be a different team that we play in a year's time because they'll... Uh, uh, maybe You're telling me they won't play Andre Pollard at the World maybe Cup? Maybe they'll pick Andre Pollard. He well, kicks all his goals and they win 18-16 and we're like, ah. Oh. The uh, South Africa rugby magazine, Zellum Nell, uh, was questioning the selection and said, is it possible that Erasmus used Saturday to show Ireland something different to what he's planned for them in France next year? Could it be the obvious pitfalls of launching the Colby experiment this week was part of a probe to see how Ireland would respond? Surely the box coaches clearly understood the potential implications to the defence and kicking game or are the wheels coming off? Has doubt crept in and are the box coaches starting to panic? Drama, I think, and rubbish. <laughs> I think you don't pick a team now and say, of course, if you, if you, if, if Andre Potter was available and they played Willemse, then they're telling everybody, we're looking at a different option. We're trying to get a bit of depth here, seeing if we need to do things differently. But that's not the case. Um, Ireland kicked the ball 23 times from, from, from hand on Saturday. South Africa kicked it 22 times. When you're in the kind of early 20s, that's not a lot of kicking in the game. 
we've gone away from that um, and I think you have to kick Why did he pick Conor Murray at the start? Um, experience I think um, Because Gibson Park Defensively Yeah I think so and I think they were looking at the impact whereas if you're taking starting Gibson Park and you're bringing Conor Murray on it's a different type of impact you're closing out a game with respect to Conor Murray more and whereas Gibson Park can run and he's quicker and um, you know he's been he's been superb and I thought Conor Murray played really well at the, at the, in that game. He'd one kind of box kick that was a little bit longer. But I thought you, you, you could, Ireland could not go out the other day and the game was not going to be about um, throwing the ball around early on. You had to be really kind of on the money with your set piece, your defensive stuff, your breakdown and your kicking game. So it was going to be that type of game early on. In the first and half. it was we, going to take time to, to, to open things up a little bit. We did actually go wide early a lot and Good the passing times, yeah. and the passing wasn't great like you would say that Ireland you know what Ger, I would say the passing maybe was a tiny bit off but their defence was incredibly aggressive it's a fair point but even even with the aggressive defence like the, the a lot of passes in the first half didn't go to hands in a way that you think maybe if this was our third game you know because it yeah it, they're go- and I said this last week it's when you come together they haven't been together since you know, um, since the summer, um, big high, and it takes time. It's it's always the start of the Six Nations as well. You're not really sure who's going to hit the ground running. Preparation is short. Um, Ireland have a better situation than most other nations because they have 12, 13 guys who are starting for Leinster. Um, so that cohesiveness is a little bit easier. But yeah. it's different calls, different game plan, different structure. Um, and, you know, when you think of of those things you're playing South Africa was very impressive and right back to the very start of what we said we needed a bit of a dogfight like this we needed to be stressed we needed no uh, I don't think you need it but I'll go back to what I said Henshaw is an absolutely incredible player with the ball without the ball his decision making his physicality Aki his power as well you bring in McCluskey and he's starting great and I think even standing close to him on Saturday in a warm-up there, he looks in u- unique kind of physical. He was always a big man, but he's kind of, you can see Whatever his incredible it. shape, right. you know. Um, it's unfortunate for him, I hadn't heard... And he's it. playing really well for yeah. Ulster this year. This was a brilliant opportunity for him. Yeah, like you would you would say that he's right there now, that he's he's that fourth centre that Ireland needs. Um, yeah, because Chris Farrell has gone out of the picture and he was there at the World Cup for Ireland and you think he was kind of the one that was there but McCluskey is right there now and, um, you know, it was a shame for him. Um, but also see Ian Henderson, we need more depth on Saturday. You know, we're stretched a little bit. James Ryan, Who's I think. Who's Henderson replacing? I'm not saying he's replacing neither Tyburn or James uh, or, um, or James Ryan but he's a, he's a British and Irish line, Nathan. Mm-hmm. He's a physical player. He's a very skillful player. We need more depth there. Well, Kieran Treadwell came off the bench. So if we go down long, you're 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 down to Ryan Baird, Joe McCarthy. They're young players still. I think that experience we we need that in the next twelve months. And Henderson, he's had a lot of bad injuries, and he's a very very good player. You could um, you could put Ty Byrne in the back row, and suddenly Peter Manny's on the bench, or Kevin Doris is on the bench. <laughs> you know. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, we've got that. But that's what I'm wondering. When you look at the performances those guys are putting in for every game with Ireland at the moment, it seems very hard to find what your best five there would be, which is... At the moment, what? they're the best five because they've they beat mm. New Zealand the last two two games and they've beaten South Africa, the world champion, so they're the best five at the moment. I think James Ryan's form with Leinster and with Ireland he's getting that z- real zip back in his game his work rate is through the roof I think he was brilliant um, again on Saturday and that's a really really big positive for Ireland um, Caelan Doris was you know what a footballer as well he is oh, that, oh, that, was, that was sensational uh, <clears throat> Des Kirby's hi lads hope you're well thanks Des hope you're well too uh, could you ask Alan Quinlan why didn't Ireland play Joey Carby against South Africa from the start we know what the brilliant Johnny Sexton brings Joey needs time at 10 the number 10 debate which is as old as Irish going, yeah I think they wanted to win the game first and foremost and um, unless Johnny Sexton and you know gets an injury and rules him out he's going to be starting at the World Cup so I think um, 
Kirby started in France last year, did really well. And I just think he... He's trying to pick his best team here for South Africa. Yeah, well, I think the South African game is like, um, we're supposed to be the world number one and they're the world champions and beat the Lions. Let's let's pick our best team for that. I can understand why he did it, right? But you think now for the next two games, Frawley starts next week, you Carver start starts the week after. For, you'll start with uh, picking from England, picking for France and the Six Nations again. Yeah. That's what you want. Yeah. Well, I have to see. You have to see what it's like, right? Yeah. He did well in Paris, didn't he? Um, they lost the game narrowly. Um, Put Sexton on the bench for those games. Yeah, and that's. Pro- I, I think it will happen a little bit. There will be a bit of. But is this not down to Joey Carberry? Like, we're 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 debating three four weeks ago. Like, is Joey Carberry Munster's best out half? Uh well, like, uh, I think he, he needs to be. He needs to put himself in a position uh, over the Christmas that we're going into the Six Nations, and there's at least a, he's in such form that you go, all right, this guy might be the form number ten in Ireland right now. But at the moment, he's miles behind Sexton. It's difficult for him with Munster as well, you know, because no. they are under that kind of pressure, you know. So, um, it's it, it invariably it ends up being stop start for 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 Joey with 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 um, the Munster stuff, then not playing games, um, injuries he's had. So, look, I, um, I, he's he is at Munster's best fly half, and I think he is a wonderful player, and I think I'd have no issue with him going in there. I, you know, you'd be a little bit nervous. I think Sexton's presence is is really important to this Irish team. He's the captain as well. He drives them. Um, but I wouldn't have started him. If you asked me this last week, would you start Joey Carberry? Not, not for that game, I think. Um, Sexton needed to be on the field. He was fit. He was available. And that's what Ireland have to do at the moment. I think, you know, bring bring Carberry in for some of the Six Nations for sure and, and, and switch it around a little bit. But they want to keep this momentum going and this debate will come on about, um, you know, we're peaking early and what's next year going to be like? Who knows? Well, that's the question. Can you imagine, we're, 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 can you imagine we're, like, you go, you beat, Aust- you beat Fiji, you beat Australia, you're heading into the Six Nations, oh, we're going to rest Johnny Sexton, bring Carberry England in, come you to lose. Dublin and beat us. And suddenly all the momentum you've spent two years building, like, that's far more damaging potentially than actually... Yeah, but how do you control that? What, what do you do? Say, well, we lose these games now and we'll win the Six Nations. Saying, you've just got to keep winning. Yeah, and I, mean, I think the they're very aware of it. I think the public are very aware of it, the media, and it is what it is. I well, think Ireland just got to try, try and keep building and really hope they can keep that momentum. Greg London says, brilliant rugby on Saturday, but what is different this time around from four years ago? The way we're playing. That's the fundamental. Well, there's two things, I think. We know, we, we have that game in, our, in the locker where we can box kick and we can, we can be pragmatic. Um, but we now have, we can now stretch teams more. I think the accuracy of passing and the ability, even under pressure, even the, that line speed they got on Saturday by Jesse Creel and Dialenda and Mapimpi, even, you remember the Hugo Keenan won the first half where he just got ball. If he could have got the pass away, you're thinking try time to Balakoon. Mapimpi gets a tackle right. Um, again, they can be a little bit sharper there, maybe a little bit deeper, but I think we're playing differently. Like, I go back to New Zealand, the way they held on to the ball in Wellington, the options, and it wasn't wide, wide stuff. It was small, intricate plays down the blind side, yeah. um, runners on the inside, support play, anticipation. That attacking stuff is is in, in better shape than it was in 2019. So that's what's different. And the strength and depth is the other we're, thing. Yeah, we're a couple of injuries away from from losing a game and being in a bit of turmoil because there's certain areas we don't have depth in. Um, Can I ask you about the wings and Balakou's performance? There's no James Lowe as well, remember well, that? And Conway and Earls, and there's a lot of players in that position. Did Balakoon do enough to put himself to the top of the pile? Didn't really get many options at all. Um, he was quiet in the game because he didn't... Um, I think he did well under the high ball. He dropped one. Um, so, not really a test for him. For some strange reason, he didn't have a lot to do. There was a lot more going on on Max, Mac Hansen's side of the wing. And obviously, Hansen finishes the try, but Balakun didn't get a lot to do. But Is it Hansen plus one then? Hansen always starts. At the moment, yeah, I think, well, James Lowe will come back into the side because I just think he's physicality and he obviously... The big left boot. Uh, yeah, and, and plus, plus he, he, he tidied up the defensive kind of issues. They weren't, they weren't a physical thing that he was afraid to tackle or it was just timing stuff and, and, and um, getting his positioning right. 
Um, so I think James Lowe and Mac Hansen are the two starters at the moment. A uh, quick word about England, who were beaten by Argentina. Does this matter for them? How much does it matter for them? What, what's the... I, you know, I looked at the press reaction yesterday and even um, Eddie Jones in his press conference was talking it down a little bit and saying, obviously, it's not ideal. There's a lot of stuff that's nearly clicking for them. And somebody asked him about the World Cup and he said, it's 11 months away. That's a long time, he said. So he seems pretty comfortable. And you can put so much emphasis on, uh, on selection and different types of players and you could never write England off from assembling a squad, even if there's younger players or new guys come yeah. in and go to a World Cup and do something. Um, so it's not ideal for them. But... I think people forget here that Argentina were always going to be a serious threat. If if you know we played Argentina last November, we beat them very convincingly, fifty three seven I think it was. Um, but what Argentina did in the rugby championship, winning in New Zealand, running South Africa close a couple of times, the Australia games as well, they were, you know, beating Australia in in, in Argentina. They're yeah. a very very good side now, Argentina. Yeah not good for England at the moment question marks again about what he's doing and the plan that um, he's a World Cup coach though really like his interest he, the Six Nations they don't have that same obsession about the Six Nations and position in the Six Nations as we do like in terms of the prize money being so important to the RFU it might be next that's because we've always been an underdog haven't we do you know what I mean and when you're an underdog to win something or be there thereabouts you know how many Grand Slams have we won Three. So, you know what I mean? If we're in a position to win a Grand Slam, we have to try and take it or a yeah. Triple Crown. It's big for us because, you know, traditionally there... Um, and it, it, the mental switch about World Cups, well, it, that's been there for a long time, you know. It, World Cups I was at, 03, 07. I remember in 07, leaving the Radisson in, in Dublin here, we are going to try and win this and get beyond the quarter final, and everyone was determined. So, 15 was the same... 11 in New Zealand. That was the one. Yeah, I think 11 and 15 were the ones where you play Wales in the quarterfinal and Argentina. That, But even by the time we got to the Argentina, the four injuries and suspension had kind of... Uh, kind but that of, was a very good Welsh side as well who probably should have beaten France in a semi-final. Warburton was sent off, so yeah. they could have easily yeah. been in a final. And ah, look. Um, we're, we're, we're small margins, but... Not anyway, Saipan next. 11 months away, but it was a good start to November Look at how Ireland. deep the trauma is that after we beat the best <laughs> team in the world, we're like, yeah, yeah, the World Cup. Where could it all go wrong? The, here's the list. <laughs> Not a bad weekend, though. No, it was a good weekend. Mm. Yeah, Villa did a good job on United for me and uh, Liverpool struggled. You're a Villa fan, of course. I am, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah Happy days. Oh, yeah. You, you, you forget about it's it for long periods, but this morning uh, he's, it's he's not all for, out there. For, for the general public United fans, it's just for my mates. If if anyone's taking offence, they're always slagging me when Liverpool lose. So um, I didn't send any text messages yesterday anyway. I just stay quiet. But you can do it today. Today's no, a perfect I won't. Day. No, Southampton will come and beat us in, in Anfield on Saturday. But... <laughs> It was a good weekend for Ireland anyway and a uh, good start. Crinny, good stuff. OTBAM brought to you live with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent Mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Up next, Colin Malani's in the studio to run through the weekend's GAA action. First, here's a bit more from Brent Pope at the Aviva on Saturday night reflecting on Ireland's 1916 win against the Springboks. You know, this effectively is a dress rehearsal. They have them in Pool B in France in yeah. 2023. You know, does this tell us a lot? Yeah, well, I mean, Andy Farrell did say that teams will lose a lot, as, learn as much from a loss today uh, as they would for a win, and I think that's probably the case because you've got to ask yourself, do you want to show your full hand before the World Cup or do you not? And I don't think Ireland showed their full hand today because I think that was due to a lack of preparation. I mean, Hugo Keenan hasn't had much game time. You know, if, if James Lowe was, was fully fit... Uh, Keith Earls were fully fit. So Ireland have a lot more options to come back in them to do that. And that was that was the thing that impressed me most today about those players, those fringe players otherwise, like Bella Coon and Jimmy O'Brien, these guys, they really stood up. So that will be the most that Farrell will take out of this, is that those players that he's looking to pencil in for a World Cup, they really stood up and cemented their, their, their position. I think players like Jimmy O'Brien in particular, they really underline today what they can add to a World Cup squad. I mean, we all know what the other players... Got. You could pick your Irish 15 now pretty much if it was a World Cup final tomorrow and everybody was fit. 
but it's those other players that need to make up the World Cup squad that you've got to look at now. And he's probably got four or five players still in the mix. Uh, so he's got to have a look at those in the next uh, few weeks because, as I say, they won't get much of a chance in the Six Nations. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, if, that, if games like that in the World Cup, bring it on because Ireland's reward for either topping their group or coming second is a game against France or the All Blacks. So, you know, it's, it's a tough group to get out of and it's a tough group even from the quarterfinals. So, but Ireland are the, are the uh, number, rank, r- number one ranked side in the world. And, I mean... You know, since I've been over here, you know, I know we they had it in 2019, but I mean, my God, how far Irish rugby has come in those years. Ah, oh, yeah, we'll take that. Uh, I like his green scarf and everything. That's Brent Pope there. Yeah, I heard. The, um, I saw Neil O'Riordan saying that it was um, reminiscent of John Delaney era press boxes. Uh, there was a South African journalist who arrived back at one stage in the middle of a match into the press box with four bottles of wine. Right, four <laughs> bottles. Wow. Now okay. I presume there were the mini bottles, but even still. Uh, there was somebody else talking about um, somehow a bunch of people were drinking in the press box that uh, that had somehow managed to get accreditation. Yeah, but that, 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 that's the point I'm making, that there was people in there who uh, maybe shouldn't have been. Or actually, you know, their work was done. I, I would have enjoyed the Martin O'Neill era and the Trapatoni era a hell of a lot more if it turned out... You know, it's just acceptable to have a couple of pints before the game. <laughs> maybe, maybe there's uh, wisdom there. Colin Mulaney's with us. Colin, how are you? Hi, lads. How's it going? What's going on? Not much now. It's, uh... well, it's going to be a great news round then, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and a big, big uh, GAA weekend. Um, yeah. Another bit of um, David Brady. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I want to start showing a bit of respect to David Brady. Who? The people around Ireland. All these coaches. Uh, this was a player. Take him down. Was it, was it a player or a coach? It was a player. I think player. Yeah. Nice. Uh, there's a few little bits, yeah. yeah. Uh, doing very well as a manager, by the way. I mean, could he be a next a future Mayo manager? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it's the madness we deserve at some stage. Uh, I mean, could, like he could he be the next Mead manager after Colm O'Rourke? Like, uh, quite possibly. I think uh, the more he's got into the club side of it, the more he's enjoyed it, and you know, it's probably starting to think uh, further down the tracks. I wouldn't be surprised if he has some sort of a role with maybe the current Mayo setup. Obviously, there's still players around the country, and oh yeah, you know, he's based Trade in Dublin, Dublin, so maybe there's an opportunity there for him to be involved. It's yeah, a good point. So. All right, breaking news. Are you? Are you no, breaking? Not, are you? Are you I'm doing David Brady on it and go. No, I've just got a text <laughs> message to say, and not, it's most certainly not the case. Categorically, not happening. Well, let's see. But I think he said before that he wants to manage Mayo, so maybe down the line. Um, I was actually at uh, Bally Bay and Cross McGlen on Saturday night. Um, pff, what a win for Bally Bay. They were really impressive. Um, Who was man of the match? Paul Finley. What age? 39. That's a mad, isn't it? Ulster and Club debut. Ulster Club debut at yeah. 39. Yeah. Still going. Will I keep going? Will I keep going? I'll keep going. Will I play well? Yeah, I'll play well. Will I be man of the match? Because Cross McGlen. Yeah. Now, so I, I didn't see any of this game at all, but I have seen uh, Thomas Niblock tweeted out uh, Reid O'Neill's goal which is a screamer oh, yeah absolute cracker cracker in the but, first few minutes yeah you know what Cross McGlenn started really well there was a strong breeze down the field and Bally Bay just kept chipping away they got a penalty that they converted and then they were a point down at half time and then they really took over at the start of the second half I mean they really attacked the Cross McGlenn kick out and just uh, you know that 15 minutes they were, they were hugely on top um, but massively impressive from Bally Bay, I think their first ever win in the Ulster Club Championship. They've been there before. Ten years ago, they were there, and Paul Finley was actually on his honeymoon, so he missed the game in the Ulster Club, and that's why it was his debut at the weekend. But um, they play Kilku next, and Jerome Johnston, uh, who is manager of Bally Bay, has three sons and I think six nephews on the Kilku team, and he's oh. uh, playing against them next weekend. So <laughs> that should be interesting. Ulster football Saturday night. What's it like? Under lights. Cold. Very cold. It was in, it was in the Gaelic Grounds in Armagh. Or the Athletic Grounds. Athletic Grounds. Sa- unbelievable venue, by the way. Uh, they had fantastic hot soup. You're on about drinking in the press box. They had brilliant hot soup beforehand. And tea and sandwiches and scones and everything like that. Looking after you well. Yeah, but a uh, lovely ground. But yeah, the Ulster Club is probably the, would it be fair to say, is the best provincial club championship well this year it seems to be anyways yeah. it's insane the amount of talent that's there there's yeah. no super clubs you see there's not, it's not biased against one giant club who's picking on the resources of counties Yeah, that's the only reason really isn't it who are you talking about there Ger? don't know uh, did you th- see that goal in the oh Kilmico Colts game what was the nice defender at proves the point that you should always kick the ball away cheat. when yeah. you can see the always free. cheat always cheat like I, I still don't understand I, I, you rarely see just explain because I hadn't seen it so uh 
nice defender is about what 30 yards from his own goal he's going across the field he's obviously penalised for over carrying or double hop but there's a free uh, in given and he just when the free is given instead of doing what most people do and just throw the ball away somewhere he just places it straight down on the ground and the Kilmacud player picks it up straight away uh, quick quick reaction and kicks it straight over his head and the goalkeeper's head into yeah. the back of the net yeah and he realises that he's made a mistake. He tries to get back to kind of block the free, but he can't get there in time. So, yeah, you should throw the ball away. Throw the ball to the referee is usually a good one because you can't say that you're throwing the ball away and he can't really bring it forward if you throw it to the referee, I think. So uh, maybe that's a, a lesson. But, yeah, like, I mean, and it was an important goal. Or that was early on in the game as well, so it was quite, kind of a crucial stage. You need a bit more of the dark arts at Kildare football. I've always said it. Yeah, we just need to be better cheaters. Turns out that's they're probably just going to join the Dublin Championship at some stage, are they? Well, uh, the, uh, they the, do it underage level. Uh, uh, is it not the Kilkenny? No. Is this Kilkenny? They play hurling in Kilkenny and yeah. right the football in Dublin. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't want it investigated, no? Uh, I mean, look, sure, nothing to do with me. Nice, nice. We're always um, never very well organised when we were kids. And we would have beaten them. We would have kind of, in, and then Nace exploded in terms of population. And in the last fifteen years, I think they've really got their shit the together. Dubs. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think most of the dubs live in the north of the county, as opposed to Nace would definitely be in the in the middle of the county. So, um, but maybe maybe there are loads of dubs. Maybe there's loads of Kildare people who like moved there yeah. because there's. There was loads an of work. interesting piece actually. I think it was in the Irish Independent last week about the sprawl of clubs and the different clubs that have won championships in the different counties, and that a lot of them are actually urban based and just the, the population surges in the urban areas that has, for example, Westport and Mayo won their first ever, uh, Moy Cullen in Galway, which is on the edge of Galway City, uh, Carrick and Shannon, St Mary's in Carrick and Shannon, that's Connacht, Strokestown then, and Roscommon is another urban, so that's just Connacht, four of the five kind of urbanish areas, you could say, Retoth in Meads, Nace, case in point, Croaks, obviously. Little old Kilmacud trying their best. Yeah, yeah. so maybe is, there's is a there study even a Kilmacud village, really? Yeah, I don't. I, I, I don't that village. far from there. I, I still organ is the village, isn't it? Yeah, there you go. Still organ, not really a village, more like a state of mind. sprawling. <laughs> it is definitely a state of mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adrian Barry's busy frantically texting, scre- in. screaming, a cheese and wine, state of mind. <laughs> uh, what else from the weekend GA? Well, uh, Bally McCarbury in women's football won the Munster Club title for the first time in 22 years yesterday. Um, they beat Banner from uh, Clare by eight points to five. And I think one of the, uh, I'm open to correction, one of the Athlone Town players from the cup final had a clash. I think Larry Ryan, who plays with Banner, I'm open to correction on that, but I think that there was a clash there and she, had to, she played the cup final, obviously. Um, but that obviously couldn't be in two places at the one time, so that was an unfortunate... A clash there. And is there actually a club from Clare called Banner, as in B A N N E R? Is that like is that the original the origin story of them being the Banner? Banner Ladies is uh, the name. Yeah, I think. Right. Okay. Um, they must have just called. There's no. There's no village called Banner. Perhaps it's like yeah. I, I maybe presume it's, a it's they were uh, the other way around. First ones in and thought, you know what? This will unite everybody together with the Banner Ladies. Uh, we should talk about um, that that game. Shelburne doing the double. Um, Beating Athlone two 0 controversial decision. I think there was a, a an offside that um, Athlone were complained about at the end of the game. But um, Shell's the best team in the country at the moment. Yeah, well they've done the double back to back league titles. Uh, obviously, it was a very dramatic end to the league season. Uh, the way it worked out couldn't have been any better from a, a neutral point of view. They've got a big crowd again to Tala. There was over five thousand at it yesterday. Uh, so these things. Uh, need big crowds we need to capitalise on the success of the women's team over the next couple of years and it's going to be fascinating to see what happens next with Shelburne I know there's a lot of talk at the moment around uh, players turning semi-pro and if the league will be able to get to that stage over the coming months and years uh, Heather O'Reilly was back yesterday this sort of bizarre scenario where uh, one of the superstars of the game comes in plays a couple of matches disappears again comes back at the end of the season plays a couple of matches uh, she's got her medals uh, but it's obviously a you know, superstar in the league does she come back again next season and play a, a bigger role can she bring more than even just her footballing talents obviously she's seen how big leagues can work and what's needed around a uh, big mm. professional league so yeah it's uh, going to be interesting to see there's an awful lot of other stuff going on as well with obviously Shamrock Rovers are entering a team what impact that'll have in P-Mount who've been you know, the dominant force for, for so long in the game yeah 
and the women's team are back this week they're into a training camp uh, from today yeah. so they're playing they're going over to Malaga for a training camp over the next week they're playing Morocco in I think they're playing them in two games but only one of them is going to be an actual official international yeah. uh, the other one's behind closed doors alright Anything else, Kyle? Yeah, uh, Seamus Power, another good night for him on the PGA Tour. He's actually into the top 30 of the world rankings now. He finished in a tie for third at the Worldwide Technology Championship uh, last night. He's top of the FedEx Cup standings as well. He finished on 18 under par. Russell Henley there was the winner on 23 under. Stephanie Meadow finished in a tie for 44th then at the LPGA Tour's Toto Japan Classic. Uh, we mentioned the Gaelic Games results and just in football later on as well, the draw, of course, of the last 16 of the Champions League made at uh, around 11 o'clock this morning or a little bit after it. Uh, the four English teams in the draw, Chelsea, Manchester City and Tottenham all seeded. Liverpool group runners up and then Manchester United in the draw for the playoff round in the Europa League. All right, Carl, good stuff. Thanks, lads. Huge for Seamus Power. Uh, backing it up, as you say, his highest ever world ranking, but also he's top now of the world points list for the Ryder Cup. It's a long way to go. It's pretty much a year to go on that. But you look at the talent in Europe at the moment and I think everyone feels there's seven nailed on players on that team who are guaranteed to be there. Uh, I think Power's pretty much putting himself in as number eight now. Like It'd be a shock. He would need a complete collapse in form at some stage over the next six months not to be on that European Ryder Cup team. Yeah, and of course this is automatic qualification at this stage now for all the majors. He's going to like... Yeah, well we had an interesting chat with uh, Peter Laurie on Golf Weekly a couple of weeks ago where you know, Seamus has had a real struggle with form actually ever since he came home for the Irish Open. He's never been able to get it back because remember he played so well in the majors at the start of the year yeah. and he'd been talking it seems about, you know, oh I need to be thinking about keeping my card again and Peter was saying like, you don't hear top 50 players in the world talking about keeping their cards and he'd been in that mindset for so long maybe he was struggling to get out of it but you know gets another win he's guaranteed his tour card for the next two years he's guaranteed all the majors I think already for next season he's playing the tournament of the champions uh, like all the, the way golf works when you're in yeah, so it's a money fight on. now. It's and the world. Thanks very easier, much. All of that <laughs> yeah. sort of stuff. So like his career, it's it's one of the great Irish success stories of recent years. From what he probably admit himself, something of a journeyman career to becoming it seems a Ryder Cup star. Yeah, no sensational stuff. Uh, good stuff, Carl. Thanks, Thanks for that. At eight fifty six this morning, you're watching OTBAM. We're brought to you live with Gillette in association with Movember Effortless Shave, Magnificent Mo. You can sign up or donate now at Movember.com. We're turning our attention to Premier League football. Liverpool narrowly beat Spurs yesterday, and to talk about it, we're joined on the line by Liverpool broadcaster and journalist Gareth Roberts. Gareth, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Morning, gents. Yeah, much better after that yesterday. Good yeah, win. Yeah, tell us about it. What what was the genesis of the win? Apart from Mo Salah being back to being Mo Salah, what else is going on that is allowing Liverpool now to uh, win games against good sides anyway? Yeah, I mean, it's back-to-back -back wins against two good sides, as you say, and I think Liverpool's mentality looks a lot better now. They look a lot less fragile. And and the big thing for me against Spurs was, was starting fast. Um, obviously, there's been this unwanted stat of conceding the first goal. I think it was eight consecutive matches at one point they were going with conceding the first goal. This time it was Liverpool on the front foot from the get-go. Um, you know, the, with the test and the goalkeeper after two minutes with that shot by Nunes, uh, which was a great effort and a good save from Larissa. And, you know, and, and the 1-0 up after 11 minutes. And, and, you know, the pattern of play was set early. You could see that Liverpool were, were confident, were, were, were going at Spurs. You know, they weren't sitting in there and saying, you come at us. It was the other way around. And I think to go to a side that's in the top four currently, that's always one of the most difficult games of the season in a brilliant stadium and everything else on the telly, the big match of the day and all that kind of thing. To go there and put on that performance and win the game was absolutely huge. And obviously, second half, um, things turned on the red. I think Liverpool had around 60% possession first half. That totally turned on its head and it was Spurs with the 60% or thereabouts second half. And, and you know, even that though, I've, I've seen that spun already as well, Spurs should have got something out of the game and maybe they should. They had some great chances. They obviously hit the woodwork a couple of times. But for Liverpool to dig in and show that character and for Eds not to go down and to come out of it with three points was absolutely huge for me because you look at the table now, Liverpool are eighth in the league, seven points behind Spurs in fourth, with a game in hand. If if we turn that on its head and say, well, what would have happened if Liverpool had lost there? Well, he would have been 11th in the league and it would have been a 13-point gap between the sides. So it was absolutely huge. 
for Liverpool to go there and win. And I think they had to win. It wasn't just about going there and getting a draw, avoiding defeat. It was go there and win. And that was the mentality of the side, I thought, from the very first whistle, and that was huge. Does yesterday not underline that it's the mentality that is the big issue for Liverpool? Because, yes, yesterday was, as you say, they, they really dug in and showed a huge amount and showed their quality as well in the first half, like they did against Napoli, like they did against Ajax, like they did against Manchester City. But in between that, they're beaten by Nottingham Forest and Leeds United. That the big, There's no question that Liverpool, at their best are still are probably not far off their very best of recent seasons but they just can't seem to get there on a consistent basis and, yeah, and how, a, does, how does he fix that considering it is only a week since they lost the Leeds yeah that is the problem isn't it and that is the thing that's got everyone scratching their head really and I think it's lots of factors rather than one um, we've talked about them many times on here but in terms of seeing a different Liverpool now and an improving Liverpool I think Canate at the back makes a huge difference I thought he was the, the best player on the pitch yesterday for Liverpool um, you know, he's winning the ball back more than any player on the pitch there. Yesterday, he's winning all his aerial duels. And, you know, you're not pushing him off the ball. He, he, he's he got a confidence about him. And I think when he's in the back four, he makes a big difference. And you look at last season, obviously, there are other centre-back options. But in the big games, Klopp was picking Canate. And so he's been a big miss for Liverpool. And he makes, he makes, more, he makes Liverpool more resilient at the back. And I thought... You know, I've come on here lots of times and talked about Fabinho as well, and and it's been a big conversation in the Liverpool fan base all season about his dip in form. And you know, people are talking about it. He's gone. You know, you, we're not getting the old Fabinho back and and things like that. I think that's a little bit dramatic. And for me, against Napoli and again tonight, I think you're starting to see some you know green shoots of recovery with him as well. I thought he was much better yesterday offered you know the screen that we know he can provide played played much better than he has done in recent weeks so all of these things count all of these things matter and I just think you know they just needed to get some confidence back for me I, I mean I, I can't pinpoint you know without going into great depth why it is that you know the the show and this inconsistency it's all the things we've said over and over it's injuries it, it, it's it's you know sitting on the hands in the transfer window and things like that and then all of those things collect you know it's the short pieces and it's the it's the 63 games last season it's all of these things together rather than being one thing it's been this sort of perfect storm of of situations altogether because even yesterday you know it ends up being a close game and, and, you know, Spurs, I've seen what Spurs fans are saying about it and they're saying, well, we deserve something from the game and Liverpool are and all that. But, you know, if we had Diaz yesterday, for instance, if we had Jota yesterday, for instance, they would have had a lot of fun. Certainly Diaz down that left side, you would imagine, would have had a lot of fun in that game. So they, they remain big misses for Liverpool. And for me, it was getting through and winning this game. We've got to do the same against Southampton. We've got a League Cup game sandwiched in between on Wednesday night, but you imagine he'll pick quite a young side for that. So go and beat Southampton on Saturday. And then we've got the World Cup to 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 reset, to have a break, to see where we're all at. Um, and then, you know, not long after that, Liverpool can hopefully go and dip into the transfer market. I mean, you know, January can be strange at times, but I'd like to think Liverpool have got some plans around it, certainly to bring some reinforcements in the midfield. Because, you know, you look at yesterday, again, got, you know, just banging on for a moment about injuries. Naby Keita's picked up another one. And it's like, you know, supposedly he was getting closer to being available. He's picked up another injury. And you know, I make that being 18 injuries since the 18-19 season, more than any other player on the books. And when you think about why he was signed and what he was meant to do and what he can do and what he is capable of, by the way, you know, again, that's a big miss in Liverpool's midfield. You know, Naby Keita at his very best can dictate games, can win games, can can set up, you know, a lot of attack and play for Liverpool. I, I remember him being brilliant away to Manchester United uh, when, you know, when we beat them 5-0 at Old Trafford. So he's capable, but he's not capable when he's injured. And look, it's not his fault and everything else, but, you know, when people talk about numbers of Liverpool's squad, there are a lot of players that they can't rely on. And, and you know, the the, the the remains a big job to be done in, in midfield for Liverpool because you've got Keita leaving, you've got Oxlade-Chamberlain leaving, you've got Milner leaving. Well, I'm saying leaving, but they're all out of contract in the summer is what I mean. And I think all of them will likely leave. So there's, there's work for Liverpool to, to be doing there in terms of the midfield. The thing about Klopp and the seven-year itch, I never quite bought it. It doesn't feel like he's in any way detached or no. less energetic or, you know, thinking about this. And, like, even even going to the diamond with the two lads up front, 
together, um, which is seems as getting the best out of both of them at the moment. Um, that's not the type of thing that, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you're in your last chance saloon, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, screw it, we'll try the diamond. And then it starts to work three or four weeks in a row, and you're like, okay, yeah, this is something interesting, it's a wrinkle here. But I, it, it seems like he's engaging his giant football brain and everybody on the staffs to try and rescue the situation they find themselves in. And like that, that must be uh, a, a challenge that he really enjoys and, and wants to see through. Um, so that that bit never struck me as, as ringing true. Um, was there any concern among Liverpool fans that that was something that that is kind of this is the start of some breakup between the manager and the club? I, I mean, I, I did see some Liverpool fans talking about that. Some people saying that, and um, some people comparing it to sort of you know his last season at Dortmund and that and that kind of thing. It wasn't for me really. I I didn't see it either. Um, what what I like about Jurgen Klopp and always I've liked about Jurgen Klopp is that when Liverpool are written off in any way, he seems to use that as a source of, source of motivation. You think about when he first arrived and quite quickly he got Liverpool sort of punching above where they were at at the time. Um, and, you know, OK, this side is now very different and we've got world-class stars right through the side and right through the squad. So, you know, t- to say we're sort of some kind of plucky underdog would be pushing it. But what we are is a side that's, you know, started the season very badly. And so that means that, you know, a lot of pundits, a lot of fans are, are now writing Liverpool off and saying they've got no chance of anything. And I, I think, you know, he will use that as as fuel internally, both for himself and for the squads. And I think you can see that already. I think a lot of people were looking at yesterday saying, well, this is a real opportunity for Spurs to, to lay a glove on Liverpool. They've not had the, the best record against Liverpool over the years. Um, and, and, you know, it was turned on its head and it was Liverpool that started faster. It was Liverpool that came out the blocks. So, you know, something's gone on behind the scenes, clearly, hasn't it? You know, you can imagine the conversations that have likely gone on. And it seems that, once again, he's engendered a collective spirit where they're able to go out and get a result. It was the same against Napoli. And hopefully now we're on a run. I mean, you know, all the conver- all the... All the questions came afterwards, both for Klopp and for the players, about, you know, is this the result that really lights the fire under Liverpool's season and stuff like that? And obviously that was played down because no one can know really what's around the corner. But you'd like to think so, wouldn't you, I would say. I mean, you know, as I said, we've got the League Cup game midweek. Um, I, I, I don't think we can pay too much attention to that because of what the team's likely going to be. Um, but at the weekend, Southampton, again, it's absolutely huge. And look, you know, we're, we're in a situation where they're likely going to lose their manager today by the looks of things. Sometimes that that can spare a, a reaction from the side, can't it? So, you know, th- there is a little bit of danger there for Liverpool. But equally, they should be looking at it, looking at where Southampton are in the league, looking at their problems and saying, get out there Saturday, put a good result on the board, score a few goals and let's say to the rest of the league, we haven't given up yet. And I think they, they did that yesterday, like I say, you know, if you think think about the alternative scenario where Liverpool lost yesterday, then we would all be talking very differently now. Liverpool would be in 11th place in the table. You would be saying that is a long way up now to get to top four. Whereas now, you know, we've reined Spurs back we've moved a little bit closer to them. And all of a sudden, you know, it, it's looking gettable again if Liverpool can get on a run. So, yeah, I think um, I, I was never worried about sort of, you know, the Klopp's going to walk away or Klopp's lost it or any of these kind of things. I just said, like I said before, I, I think if you calmly look at the situation, you look at the injuries and everything else, you can you can see why it hasn't quite worked this season. But now for me, you know, there are things to be getting excited about, you know, there was already, you know, Nunes was written off after a handful of games, it felt to me, including by some Liverpool fans. He's fascinating you know, to watch, isn't he? he like, watching he is, him yesterday, he? He, was, he was arguably the best player on the pitch. He was unbelievably good. Yet at the same yeah. time, if he was just a little bit better, Liverpool probably would have won the game 4-0. Like, his close control, his first touch is as good as it gets, but his second touch is woeful. So he'll bring the ball down perfectly and then the second he has to think about it, the ball's five yards away from him. But the little bit of chaos he brings into it and... And also, actually, it does look as though he's developing, like the the layoff for Salah for the goal. Yeah. He he he, he well, now he, seems to yeah. be looking up and going. Actually, there's a simple pass on here. I'll do that. Like he, I'd be shocked if he doesn't somehow score a goal that's goal of the season between now and the end of the season. hundred uh, percent. But at the same time, 100%. he's I don't know if he's going to score if he's going to score 15 goals, which Premier League goals, Liverpool probably need him to do. 
Yeah, I mean that that that's the thing with him, isn't it? I think he's he's very likable as a fan because you can see absolutely every bit of effort is going into into the game, and that's first and foremost what you want to see as a supporter. So we see him chasing back, you know, sprinting back at times to to help in defence. And you know, you seen him yesterday, you know, challenging for those couple of headers, um, and, and you know, wildly so at times. You know, there, there is there is a bit of the dog in him. Uh, which is enjoyable to watch. And, you know, he's got to sort of stay the right side of the line. And obviously he's already been sent off for Liverpool and people are saying, well, I think we'll probably see another red card. But I'm with you in that equally. I think he's 100% got a goal of the season in him. I love the way he took that that early chance after two minutes. It was a great effort on the run. We saw something similar to that against West Ham at home as well. Both times the keeper make the, the keepers are making really good saves. But he he's really unpredictable, isn't he? You don't know what you're gonna get from one minute to the next. And and while, you know, you can bemoan that a little bit and you can say at times his touch isn't the best and he doesn't he maybe doesn't make the right decision. I always think how do you set up to defend against Darwin Nunes then? You know, if you're the centre half or if you're the full back, because he was drifting out to the wings, wasn't he? You know, what how do you prepare for it? You know, if you're given video clips by your team and you sat at home with your brew watching them, you must be thinking, well, I don't, I don't know what this lad's going to do next. And that, that to me is a good thing. I mean, you, you use the word chaos and I think that's absolutely bang on for Darwin Nunes. He creates chaos. He, he, he creates anarchy around around defences and he will score goals for Liverpool will it be will he score enough well we, we can only only time will tell but I think already and you referenced it I think already you can see he's getting better he's settling down he doesn't look like he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders There's a lot of smiling going on mm. when when he when he's playing the game and you know little little points at his teammates and, and our teammates putting arms around him and all that kind of thing yeah so it feels like there's been a big collective efforts at Liverpool to make him fit in. We know that he's he's not up to speed with the language and things like that. But it's not all about the language, is it? You know, and and, and I think it, it looks like everyone is doing the best to, to try and get the best out of him and equally he's doing his best to to save Liverpool. Gareth, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Cheers, boys. Thank you. It's uh, Gareth Roberts giving us his thoughts there. Uh, OTBAM brought to you each morning with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Here's what's on OTB Sports Radio for you today. OTB Gold is Michael Rasmussen talking about doping. Splunk is live at three o'clock. Our classic game club is the hybrid tunnel match. Arsenal versus Manchester United from 2005. I'll see you out there. I'll see you out there. That one? Yeah. Yeah. No, not that one. John O'Shea. That one, yeah. That John O'Shea uh, Oh, my Cork accent's getting the, getting the. Well, that's fair enough. I don't think so. It's perfect. Sonia Sullivan is live from uh, at six. Joe is live tonight from seven with the evening uh, show. Plenty more reaction to Ireland's win from the weekend and loads more on the football show too. You can follow OTB across our social channels and subscribe to the OTB podcast network for all the best latest sports content. Uh, after the break, we're back with the former Man City defender Neda Manua looking back at Manchester City's last minute win against Fulham and the ongoing brilliant form of Arsenal. First though, Kenny Cunningham was alongside Stephen Doyle on commentary for off the ball for Spurs and Liverpool. Here he is post-match talking about Matt Doherty's current conundrum under Antonio Conte. And just on the, the Matt Doherty, Emerson Royale debate, uh, and obviously you, you think Doherty is the better man to have in there. I'm just trying to think of Conte's reasoning because we have seen Doherty putting good performances when he has been called upon and he was praised for Conte a week after criticising him. But has he seen Doherty maybe, not just in Spurs games but for Ireland as well, showing some defensive weaknesses and that he maybe thinks Emerson Royale is a better defender? I don't know. What's your? Do you think Emerson Royale is well, a better defender? He might think that. I certainly don't. Oh, we, I, we, we all understand Matt's strengths are certainly in his, uh, his, in his attack and play. That's always been the case. We saw that Wolves in terms of his, you're talking about stats there in terms of goals, assists. Matt's record at Wolves was absolutely phenomenal. And we've seen a bit of that in the Spurs jersey as well. Yeah, is he as strong from the defensive side of his game? No, but if you're telling me Emerson Royale is rock solid defensively, I certainly wouldn't agree with that either. I think he's very loose in that respect. And actually going forward gives you very little... Uh, in terms of uh, product in the last tour of the pitch and this system Spurs are playing play a wing back system you have to get that with that bit of penetration down the sides from your wing backs you haven't got a winger uh, in front of you so you're very much dependent on those wing backs like he was at Inter Milan with Perisic to an extent play there Hakimi is right wing back they were absolutely crucial in terms of the success that he had that at Inter Milan he's not going to get that from Emerson Royale so I'm really surprised it's taken him this long we spoke about how well Matt finished this season I know he was injured for the last couple of games but prior to that it looked as if he'd found his feet I actually thought defensively he was looking as solid as he has been uh, 
in terms of his general play and we all know the quality that he brings in terms of uh, uh, as an attacking threat so me for me that's an obvious one I, 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 don't, I don't see that you're talking about going in at Dublin Allegiance and we want to see all our, our own do well of course we do but I can park that to the side right. what I'm saying he has to play in in, the, in this team now because he gives them far more from an attacking point of view and I don't see any type of drop off in terms of his def- defensive qualities as well and I think Spurs benefited from that when he made the substitutions Perisic as well I mean Perisic can play every where he's, he's a bit of a monster he done okay in that central area but he looked a little bit at our source with his back to play far more comfortable receiving the ball wide on the left and driving at Alexander Arnold and getting crosses and arriving late at the back post so yeah just those uh, those little tweaks those substitutions those alterations that content made just came a little bit too late for Tottenham OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio Ireland's first and only sports radio station OTB GAA what is it, a Monday club and a Tuesday club? Uh, well, there's Monday and a Tuesday club, and then I'm, I'm too old, so there was no Wednesday club for me, so uh, I had to go back to work. When you, when you text me Tuesday, there was no way I was going on Wednesday. But, uh, watch. Uh, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Subscribe to the OTBGAA podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent modes. It's 14 minutes past nine. Uh, we're going to say good morning to Nedim Manua. Nedim, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, pretty good. Um, I'm a Villa fan, so I'm absolutely thrilled this morning. Uh, Nathan likes Liverpool, so he's also pretty happy. And I'd say the Man City fans are absolutely delighted with life. Because yeah, yeah. if anything Sorry. was going to derail you, it was going to be a sending off in one of those games and, you know, <laughs> maybe you lose it. But actually, last minute penalty and Erling Haaland steps up. Thanks very much. You know what? I do support City, but I can't take you saying you. I'm not part of that. As an ex-player, I can't be part of it. They're okay, fair enough. I played anyway. Fair enough. <laughs> but, uh, fair enough. In uh, in regards to that, like you see, that City looked very comfortable before the red card. Then the red card came, and you sort of wondered because Fulham are a good side. Obviously, they were missing Mitrovic and Cabano, but you think in Fulham for a good football side that they are, they're probably going to try and take it to Man City more. But in fairness to City, I think because they almost felt they were wronged by the red card. And, you know, if you lean blue, you'll think it definitely wasn't a red card. If you lean any other way, you're probably thinking it was. But what they did, they continued to sort of be progressive and play the game the way that they wanted to. I think the stats from half time. So the red card was after 26 minutes. And at half time, City had, Man City had 72% possession. And at the end of the game, they had 71. So they really believed in what they were trying to do. And they made so few errors than. The fact is they were very much in the game. And then when you can bring on like a Phil Foden and Erling Haaland, but then still have a Kevin De Bruyne out there, you're always going to be in with a chance. So I think uh, a lot of City fans left that game feeling very happy because the team showed a bit more than, say, what they usually show because they had to show a significant fight because they weren't the underdog because they were playing at home and it was against a newly promoted side. But the way in which they did it was very, very impressive because when you're down to 10 men, the easiest thing to do in the world is just to be playing channel balls and just trying to play for territory. But... In fairness to them, they tried to control the game the way that they normally do and they ended up getting the result that they think they deserved. Pep Guardiola obviously decided not to rush Erling Haaland back from the start, put his faith in Julian Alvarez again. So Alvarez came in from River Plate and there was an expectation initially, I think like a lot of these players, he'd go off on loan for a couple of years and uh, get a lot of game time maybe over in Spain or at one of other, the other Manchester City clubs. Uh, he's kept them here, he's playing some matches. What was his performance like and is he a... If not anyone's a potential rival to Erling Haaland, is he a is he a straightforward <laughs> replacement for Haaland, or could he potentially play up front with Haaland? Um, I think he can play up front with him, but he's he's completely different. Like firstly, he's half his size. That's what it, that's how it looks. So you know that's a whole different way to to play. But I think he has some similar traits because firstly he's a good finisher, and I think secondly as well, as is the case with people who play up front for City, you're not going to get a ton of touches, but you still need to make the right runs. And I think in Alvarez, he does that very, very well. He's very persistent. You know, he'll go and press. He'll continue to make the runs. And he won't just be once and then throw his arms up and say, why are you not playing me in? Like, he'll continue to do it. And I think when they went down to 10 men, his role was important because that overload can be in the wrong areas unless you have a striker who's willing to occupy two centre-backs, in which case you're kind of man-to-man everywhere else. So I think he did a very good job of that. He stayed patient, made the right runs, created a few opportunities off the back of that. And then even for his goal before the, they went down to 10 men, I think it was a great running behind. It was a great ball by Gundogan, a good finish. You know, you want to go out there and and score because everyone know, everyone thinks that when Haaland's out there, he's going to score. And I think if you can have any sort of feeling like that around him when people see him, then it'll be great because he did, he played so well. But then as soon as Haaland was standing on the sideline ready to come on, you, you felt like an energy change in the stadium. 
But Alvarez is definitely on the road towards being trusted more by those Man City fans. But unfortunately for him, it's hard to get a game when the other guy's already on 20 goals already this season. But he seems he seems a good sign and seems like he can develop. And the crazy thing is, like, we also forget him and Haaland are a very similar age. So they've got probably the best years ahead of them to come. Did De Bruyne die for the penalty? I don't think he dives now. Because if you look at it, um, Anthony Robinson, I think it is, he knew. So he's not really tried to really kick him, but he has caught him. And I think if he hadn't, I think Robinson would have been complaining a bit more. So it looked like he just, he'd got his ankle a little bit. And it was good. It was a great bit of movement by De Bruyne. And I think ultimately, as somebody who would complain every time I felt I was wrong for a penalty, I think the reaction of the defender kind of says more than maybe we saw of our own eyes. Yeah, I thought uh, when I was watching it live that it was a penalty straight away. There's definitely some contact. The more you watch mm. it back, you look and think, is there enough contact that De Bruyne can spin around and throw himself down like that? Probably not, but it's in injury time at the end of the game. If the defender touches you like that, every player in yeah. the world is going down. And I think, as you say, the defender's reaction uh, mm. was interesting. Mm. Just on Jack Grealish, I saw him getting a bit of criticism again for his performance uh, at the weekend. And we a month on from, say, the Manchester Derby, where he was unbelievably good and really set the tone from the start for Manchester City. We're, in the next couple of days, going to start getting all the World Cup squads. And I just wonder on Grealish and, say, Phil Foden as well, who maybe, except for the Manchester Derby, is also not quite hit top form this season. Do you think that's impacting on players, the fact that the World Cup is coming and they want to be a big part of it? Maybe even going back to our Liverpool chat and somebody like Van Dijk, with the injury problems he have, do you think it's a factor in players' performances at the moment that they're thinking, I don't want to get injured, I just want to keep things steady until I get to Qatar? Uh, I don't think so, no. I don't think so. And the reason I say that is because, you know, football folk, we, we're very simple. We see what's in front of us and we do our best within that. So if there's a training session or a game, like you go 100%. And for those players who'll be going to the World Cup and being significant parts of it, they didn't arrive at that point from picking and choosing their moments. You know, they will be trying, but there will be lapses in form. There'll be selection issues like Phil Foden, I think, in the last three games hasn't started for Pep Guardiola, which must be really frustrating because he's he's like obsessed with winning. So I think the the World Cup itself will become the biggest issue the moment the games on next weekend are done. And I think as well, there's the... If you have a manager, say Gareth Southgate, if he had a thing where he said you have to be playing in 90% of your games for your domestic side and be scoring X amount of goals and then that's why you'll be selected, then that's one thing. But for these players... Southgate could say he likes them whether they're playing well, playing badly, not playing or playing every single week. So for them, they can just really focus in on their club football because the season doesn't end on Sunday next week or this week, next week. It doesn't end on Sunday this week. They will play in that game and they want to set themselves up to be in a great position to kick on in the second half of the season. So for them, if they're lax in any particular way, you know, they'll be out of the team by the time they come back. Even if they, they could... They could go and win the World Cup and come back and see that the place isn't there. And that's due to the comp competitive nature of, say, some of those positions that they're in. So I don't think people are really thinking about the World Cup like that. I think we're thinking about it more from the outside because we're seeing the sort of bigger picture. But as soon as the ball's kicked, you know, it's a different sort of setup. And I thought that, especially watching that Arsenal versus Chelsea game, for anyone who saw that, that was such a passionate London derby, you know, tackles flying in everywhere, real anger, rage, frustration, everything going on. But then you should, you should, we should be thinking, oh, but it's the World Cup soon. At that point, it didn't matter. And you saw those celebrations at the end for Arsenal and for City as well, because those results were huge in terms of maintaining momentum and the thing that matters most of them right now, which is the league. Let's talk a little bit about Arsenal. They're starting themselves to believe that they are title contenders and they're bringing a lot of people with them. I think we were sitting in the studio over the last week or so. Nobody really expects Arsenal to man maintain their talent for the rest of the season. I wasn't sitting here when that conversation happened. <laughs> and, and, no, he wasn't, in fairness. He's, he's, been, he's been on the Arsenal uh, bandwagon since the start. But they, they are winning people over week on week on week with uh, different types of displays. Sometimes yep. it's the irresistible attacking force of the kids up front and then sometimes it's the gritty, sheer nature of the quality of defence and, mm. you know, just being really difficult to beat um, yeah. they've got a lot going on yes yes they have and, and that bandwagon I think I was I was semi on it like a few weeks ago but I think I'm fully on it now and it was due to the nature of that performance because it's a way to Chelsea a side that needed to bounce back after losing to Brighton you know there's a chance for them to gain momentum in front of their fans uh, Derby to put Arsenal in their place but the exact opposite happened and the thing for Arsenal it wasn't as you mentioned it wasn't just because the front three played really well like they did I thought the front three did okay, but I looked at the defence and I thought Gabriel played really well. Saliba played really well. Ben White played well. Zinchenko played well. Partey in front of them was sweeping up everything. And 
Arsenal just looked a better side. I think as they step away from the game, I think Chelsea had five shots. They only had one shot on target. Like Ramsdale's had to field one shot away from home in the Premier League to a rival. So when they look back at that performance, you know, they've got such a young team, but they have a little bit of something extra as well right now. And obviously the belief matters when you're top and you've only dropped five points all season. But they found different ways to do it. And then when it came towards the end of the game in terms of game management, all of a sudden you've seen Shaka come to the forefront, Gabriel Jesus come to the forefront of it. Like To describe how different they are, in the 94th minute with one minute left to go, uh, Granite Xhaka's in the corner pretending to be outraged by something and pretending to fight someone. But all he's doing is wasting time and he's drawing over more Chelsea players to draw them in. And you can see he's never going to do anything a couple of years ago or last year. Maybe Shaq is getting himself sent off or there's a bigger issue there. But instead, he's controlling the situation in, in a sort of subtle dark arts way, which comes through experience. And that's exactly what makes them so good this year because they have a, such a good blend of everything. And fair play to them. They went there. They, I think they probably had more possession. They've had comfortably more shots. They looked the better side. And they looked like a team that's top of the Premier League for me. And I was very, very impressed by them. The question that kept coming up oh, in recent weeks was defensively when the pressure came on how they would handle it and a sense that Gabriel and Saliba are young players would they you know, there's a mistake in them this kind of uh, arsenal of your and they'll always uh, shoot themselves in the foot eventually like the two of them were exceptional yesterday mm. uh, have you and maybe you always felt they were exceptional have you changed your opinion on Arsenal defensively as the season's gone on? Um, in terms of individuals I think the the criticism of like Gabriel that he might have a mistake in him like I think that still kind of does exist but the longer it goes between those mistakes the better we have to the more we have to give him credit for it and I think individually they can defend well in this instance I thought Saliba was very very good like I thought he was very good yesterday but then they also have the backing of someone like a Ben White who's bombing forward on the right side but then has defensive tendencies as a, as a centre back out there as well and also I think when you play Arsenal it's not really just people isolated 1v1. The structure is so good. You can see that Arteta's put his sort of fingerprints on that team and they know how to defend against situations. I think there were a couple of times in the first half where Chelsea kind of got in behind, I think, their left side. But then there were bodies that were always coming in to sweep in the right spots. And outside of that, across coming into the box, everyone's in position. Partey's in there, Shaka's in there, and they're set to go and try and hit a counter-attack and stuff like this. So you need to... First, you need to be able to take your chances when you play against them. But in terms of goals that they'll concede, they don't look like a team's going to concede loads of really silly goals. And individually, I think Saliba has been one of the best players in the Premier League this season. And, you know, perhaps he'll be able to continue that for the rest of the season. But look, defensively solid, not because of just the back four, but the entire setup. You've got pressing from the front from Saka, from Martinelli, from Jesus. And then that's backed up in midfield by Odegaard getting in on the six. You've seen Partey and Saka really understand how to just try and win balls around the field. And I think that really affected Chelsea yesterday because whenever they were trying to play out, the pressure was there and you could sort of hear it from the crowd. The ball would go back to, to the goal and then he's passing it to Shalaba, he's passing it to Thiago Silva, passing it to Aspilicueta and that's the principle that Potter wants. But now they don't have the same options because they've got a different look because Arsenal right there with them. And I think that type of stuff there means that you can never really put good quality up against them. And then defensively, the people who are who can be more dominant are in there with the best opportunity because the quality into the strikers is never going to be as good. Do they have enough strength and depth to maintain this challenge over the rest of the year or do they just need good luck with injuries? I think everyone needs good luck with injuries, to be honest, because you think about, say, from the Man City perspective, they're two points behind and they've done quite well this season, obviously. Like, if Haaland's out for two, three months and Alvarez comes in, but there is a difference right now between Alvarez and Haaland and maybe your ceiling comes down a little bit but they still have the same ability to win games. And I think as I look at that Arsenal side, you know, it can be very easy to think about all the things that could go wrong, but every team is going through the same emotions. Like what happens if the other star players for other teams are get injured, say, during the World Cup or just while their time's away or they come back and it's a turn of year, then there's loads of games and they struggle. The depth, it might not be the same, but then in the same breath, like there are players who play in that side who will finish their careers with seven, 800 games and it's not going to come because it can only play in half, half the games in any particular season, so... I have a belief that even though some of them might drop out, they've still got enough quality to be able to win games because they have a structure in play, which makes perfect sense. Like when Zinchenko's coming off yesterday and then you're bringing on a Scottish, like bringing on Tierney, a Scottish international, that's a good spot to be in. You know, so I, um, I do have belief in them. Obviously, things could go wrong. But like I say, things could go wrong for everybody. But while it's not going wrong for them, they're printing points at the minute. And to have only dropped five through 13 games, whatever it is, like we have to realise this is a third of the way through the season and they're right up there so why can't they continue it? Yeah, I think um, their fixture list 
either side of the World Cup is actually pretty sweet as well. So there's mm. a good chance they'll still be where they are at the start of January. And then, you know, then the confidence starts to come from, hey, we're, we're right here toe-to-toe with Manchester City. And then Manchester City have all of the distraction of desperately trying to win the Champions League. Um, mm. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Mm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And the Champions League, you know, it'll affect other teams as well that are in it. You know, Liverpool trying to find a way into the top four. They'll be playing Champions League. Chelsea are in the last stages as well. Spurs are in there as well. And for Arsenal, you know, the reality is they've got those Thursday, Sunday setups in the Europa League and they're one of the favourites for that tournament. I don't think Arteta's going to be the type of person to just disregard that, even if he's doing well in the league, because it's another, it's a, it's a chance to win silverware. And for a manager, if you think a game is a game when your team's winning football matches why do you want to sort of say well this one doesn't matter all the games between now and the end of the season matter so I love the the fact that we don't know what the second half of the season is going to be like obviously there are issues in terms of the World Cup and the timing of it and, and the like but this does feel different but then I also think it feels exciting because you literally don't know because for all you know some of your players might come back after a week after two weeks of the World Cup while some might be there for the full four weeks and then how do you prepare for the next game? It's going to be really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, the Premier League's going to going to provide us with lots of highs and lows again. I, I I just wonder what the dynamic will be in so many clubs after the World Cup because we just don't mm. know. Like, think, take Manchester City. What if England win the World Cup? Imagine. Yeah. Imagine if England win. And Phil oh, Foden is the man of the match in the, the World Cup thing. final. That's the last thing a lot of nations want to see. Well, I can they, say uh, that for uh, a fact. Uh, we may well be among them. Uh, imagine <laughs> Phil Foden's man of the match in the World Cup final. He's going back to training. He's like, Erling Haaland. Out of the way, I'm the superstar here now, and Erling Haaland can't cope with that. Uh, yeah, or, or if they go or, on the piss for the week afterwards, which it, is more likely. Listen, exactly. These these are very very good points. I think most people feel confident England probably won't win the World Cup, but you never know. It's football. You never know. You need to be in it to win it. Um, but oof, yeah, oof, it's going to be so. Cutting. Yeah, sorry. That that feels like an attack. Wow, that was not that, meant that to was. go that way. <laughs> Wait, next time. Yeah. Next time. Next time. Yeah. But it should be good. Uh, I do think it's going to be really weird because loads of players aren't going. So. Do they have? Do they dedicate themselves and have this incredible fitness regime, or do they go and lie on a beach for two weeks and lose a bit of form? <laughs> do they do a little bit of both? Well, look I at, look go, at Gabriel sorry, Mar- Martinelli. Sorry, so we're seeing that uh, he's not going to be in the Brazil squad, which I think was more or less expected. He was sort of on the periphery of it, anyways. But say Brazil were, win the World Cup. So on one hand, you say Martinelli's now fully rested. He's coming back uh, December twenty sixth, fit, ready to lead Arsenal's title charge. Or Brazil win the World Cup, and he's sitting at home looking at this, and he's absolutely sick. And he's devastated when he's coming back in with his club. Going, I missed out on this. Yeah, and Cousin has the best second half of the season of any world just, football, inspired to, to greatness. Like who that. knows? You missed. Yeah, it's um, there's a lot of unknown unknowns, but it's definitely going to be good. That and that was brilliant. Thanks very much. One last thing. I don't think you see any of the Aston Villa Manchester United game. I don't think we've talked enough about this, but um, it's been a long time for Villa fans waiting for a home win against Manchester United, and they were fully deserving of it. So I don't know. Even if you've just seen the highlights, I don't care. Uh, tell me what you thought. It just seems crazy, doesn't it? But then you look at it, and I think Unai Emery became the third Villa manager in a row to win their first game of uh, their tenure. So maybe it was easy money to just pick them. So <laughs> Boom. I know the, the Man United versus Villa thing, it's not a competition. Like I think it's mid-90s when they last beat them. So it shouldn't go that way. But they did it once, and then lo and behold, who are they playing midweek? It's Villa Man United again. So imagine if he does it twice. Well, be the best manager they've ever seen. There you go. There you go. If uh, if he is, um, then the good times are rolling. Nedim, great to have you with us. Thanks a million. That was brilliant. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. It's uh, Nedim Manu there giving us some thoughts on the uh, weekend's football. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, he's very good. You're very excited, Jer. I mean, come on. Like, R- Rick Jagger uh, has been in touch. I don't know, did he text in or is he watching it on YouTube? But he said, I shook Jer's hand on Saturday evening, one item off the bucket list. All right, Rick. You didn't tell me you were Rick Jagger now. That was, uh, I mean, I only shook hands with one person, I think. So. Okay. I'm getting to the stage again. People are shaking hands. You don't like it? I'm going to have to get the old hand sanitizer out. <laughs> COVID is returning. <laughs> you uh, you were always a uh, kind of germaphobe anyway. Well, <laughs> you, the, you leaned into it for a couple of years. Was, uh, <laughs> finally, I, I was allowed to be my true self. Nathan, wouldn't, Nathan thought it was a disgrace that we were leaving newspapers in the studio when COVID was on. Like, People are reading the same newspapers and they're touching them. What's going on? I was like, I left them there. He's like, oh, uh, still, don't do it. I think it's fair enough. They're not going kind to of get COVID from the newspaper. Well, I didn't know that at the time, did I? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, right. Uh, you people never gave Arsenal any analysis over the last two years to support any bandwagon, says somebody whose um, YouTube username is 20 years ago. 
I don't know, I think we had plenty of Arsenal losses there. We were just very Arsenal over the period of time where it was a good performance, a bad performance, a good performance, a good performance, a good performance, a bad performance, a bad performance, a bad performance. They were flaky as, as F, right? And um, But they stuck with the manager and there's a lot to be said for sticking with somebody who has a very clear identity of how they want the team to play. And then they're also pretty blessed in that some of the young players came through and continue to improve. You know, a lot of that's down to coaching, but a lot of it is also kind of freakish that several players at the same time come together yeah but it is it's uh, you sign good players so they sign Martin Odegaard who obviously everyone's known about since he was about 14 or 15 but they have got him at just the right time uh, Saka and Martinelli come through but they have a manager who has allowed them to come through who has given them the game time who's allowed the inconsistency you get with young players over the last couple of years but also they've been blessed to sign Gabriel Jesus and Alexander Zinchenko who it turns out you know may not have quite been what Pep Guardiola wanted but are amongst the best players in their position in the league and have that Manchester City mentality of, well, we have Premier League medals, we want more Premier League medals, we're not, you know, we're mid-twenties, we're not just ste- stepping to Arsenal to retire here, yeah. we want to go and win more things. Yeah, and Jesus has the World Cup coming up as well, so, uh, right, some more stuff about the Aviva, where does it just disappear? The Aviva Stadium is a mess for matches, says Conor Whelan. Don't get me started on the music intervals, too many people there with zero interest in the game, it's a social, same for Three Arena. I mean, uh, people are literally going to socialise at the Three Arena. Are they, you know, are you not allowed to have... This seems a little bit like uh, Richard Keyes and the Celebration Police, just a little bit to me. Like, oh, it's... During the gig, are you not allowed to go and get a drink? Uh, well, the last gig I was at in the Three Arena, I remember going to get a drink, and uh, it did not go down well, I can tell you, with the people around me. Well, what, you, like, what am I meant to do here? Are you, are you, you're like Roy Keane there. I, they're like I Roy Keane giving out to people singing. Been, I, I'm like, I haven't been to a gig in about six years. <laughs> can I have, can I have a, a, one quiet drink hit during this? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a difficult balance that you leave it. The music thing for me is insane. Uh, at soccer matches at rugby matches at everything at the Aviva it's way too loud. It totally dominates the build up to now be playing it during the games. Uh, you go go to a Premier League match and they can try their little bit of razzmatazz and all of that but there's a nice lull before the game as the crowd comes in, as the atmosphere slowly builds, and maybe just as the teams are coming onto the pitch, they'll play their theme song or whatever else, and it'll hit a crescendo there. But this thing, from an hour out, we have to just throw this unstoppable noise at you so you can't have a conversation, which is the case at the Aviva, before games. You cannot have a conversation with the person sitting beside you because the noise is so loud yeah. in the tannoy. It's... Um it's actually not as loud up in the gods as it is in the press box. Maybe there's big speakers there to Probably just to make just sure annoy that, me. Just make sure the broadcast is um, somehow compromised. But I don't know. I think people are always giving out about something. But why? But why do you need to play music in the middle of the game? There's no reason to play music. What? What did Bruce playing Bruce Springsteen do? It didn't to add to the match. It didn't have the, the little bit of karaoke. Like it just it's, so rugby matches are very 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 long. When you're see when you're at home, you have your phone and you're like you're on your phone and you're chatting to the people in the living room when the game stops okay you're not <laughs> when the game is stopped for like three and a half stretching into four minutes as they're yeah, doing the three injuries chatting to people around you uh, well you do you can do that the music wasn't too loud to be able to do that but um, Rick Jagger could have been right beside you he could have had a great old conversation there was a there was a, a a South African fan like the most virulent South African fan who was clearly from the north like just an Irish person with an but right behind it but never got the story of like why you know why what, what 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 attracted you to this South African team instead of like the Ireland team where you're from well it's, it's an interesting little dynamic of course whoever Ireland are playing so maybe we should just sort of use the but I don't I, I, I don't care if there's a three and a half minute them. break you still don't need a bit of Bruce Springsteen randomly thrown into the mix if, if the or the Black Irish. Eyed Peas no, I mean, if there'd been, like, just good Irish music. But if they'd done the, Zombie or something. Well, exactly. There, if, if there was some real thought put behind it as to, actually, this is a song that will either start a bit of singing or... They do... Um, more more Irishness. They do enter Sandman at a lot of the um, NFL... Mm. Not the NFL games, the student college football. It's brilliant. Oh, it's insane. Yeah. Like, but that, that's cool. Yeah, so, I like, if, if they get it like, right... I don't mind the, um, the Chicago Bulls entrance music that they play when Ireland are coming on the pitch for the football matches because it's been there for so long now. Yeah. And you put in a bit of give it a lash jack. Yeah. That's no, it's great. Nicely. The pretty much the, the Denmark game. Minutes beforehand, no thanks. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Old man, old man Nathan not happy oh, even though everybody's a winner. 
Uh, OTVAM brought to you live with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent Mo. Our efforts will be revealed in the uh, coming days. You can sign up or donate now at Movember.com. We're back tomorrow morning. Shane Hannon and myself. Shane was at the game. He was at the, the Villa Man United game as a Man United fan. Old Jonah himself. Uh, Graham Hunter's going to reflect on Jared Piquet's last ever game of football. We'll have the legendary Tipperary hurler Park Maher in studio to talk about his new book, All on the Line, a memoir of hurling and commitment. And none other than Irish boxing legend Eric Donovan will reflect on his amazing career following his retirement announcement last week. Right now, we're going to leave you with the best of the Sunday paper review, where Joe was joined by Cleena Foley and Roy O'Connor. We'll see you tomorrow. Sunday papers, great to have you with us. So I'll run you through the front pages. As you might imagine, the rugby dominates. So we've a picture here at the Sunday Independent, and it's Matt Canson. Uh, just after he went over for uh, Ireland's second try, start of the second half, and he's throwing the ball in the air, and he's got Jimmy O'Brien for company. Undisputed number one is the headline, uh, but Sexton insists Ireland have won nothing yet, is the front page of the Sunday Independent. Sunday Mirror, they've uh, Peter Mahoney post-match giving a thumbs up to the camera. Worldies, Farrell praises Irish heroes as mighty boxer beaten, but Sexton urges caution. And then Ace Reese is a world champion. So Reese McGlenaghan, uh, crowned world champion, first ever Irish gymnast, to be crowned a world champion. He won uh, gold on the pommel horse at the World Artistics Gymnastic Championships in Liverpool in the final yesterday, 23 years of age. And he just missed out in Tokyo as well. He was desperately unlucky at the last Olympic Games to miss out in Tokyo. Um, or sorry, excuse me, he finished seventh at Tokyo, but he was uh, in the mix for uh, potentially medal places. So a uh, big day for him. We have Sunday Times, and again, it's Matt Hansen, see you in France, which I guess was an aspect of yesterday. Ireland will play South Africa on September 23rd in Paris. Ireland lay down World Cup marker with victory over Springboks. And then O'Neill hits back at critic Keith Andrews. This is Martin O'Neill, who's uh, taken aim at uh, Keith Andrews in his new autobiography, which we'll come to in just a moment. It's uh, serialised there in the Sunday Times. Uh, Sun Sport. Again, it's uh, Mac Hansen on the uh, top, Andy Slingen and the rain, world champions KO'd, and then Erling Haaland uh, says scoring for Manchester City in the last minute. Yesterday, one of the most nervous moments of my life. He took a last minute penalty to win the game for City. Uh, Matt Doherty also on the back page of the Sun here insisting there's no personal issue between him and Antonio Conte. And the Sun also on that back page have Reese to the top, Reese McLennan yesterday making history, Ireland's first ever gymnastics world champion. Uh, Mail on Sunday. Again, same picture, Matt Hansen. It was, I mean, it was an amazing moment when he went over. Ireland 19, South Africa 16. Ireland top of the world after defeating the reigning champion, says Rory Keane. Sunday World, if you're into this kind of thing, have a new format, new font on their uh, back page. So, box office is the headline. Ireland laid down a World Cup marker with thrilling win over the champions and Klopp's war chest is their other headline. So, Jurgen Klopp has been given the green light to embark on an overhaul of the Liverpool squad, says uh, Kevin Palmer on the back page of the Sunday World. Very happy to say, Clint Foley, journalist and broadcaster here in studio, as is Roy O'Connor of the Irish Independent. You're both very welcome. Uh, you were at the Aviva Stadium last night. I was. Even though at halftime it was only six points apiece, it was a bloody interesting six points apiece first half, and then second half took off. Yeah, yeah, no, it was. I thought I found it. I Neil, we'll come to it. I think Neil Francis is quite talk, talking down the quality that was on show and and yeah. takes almost a counterpoint view on it. But I thought it was a really high quality. Um, uh, you know, sorry, I'm falling into the trap of calling it absorbing, uh, absorbing test match. But it was it it. From minute one, the level of physicality on display was was off the charts. And look, there's an undercurrent there that's going, is this healthy for the game in the long term? But there is still something fascinating about seeing players of that size thundering into each other with, with such a level of ferocity and intensity. And But Bernard Jackman has the line in his piece. Um, he met one of the injured box. He doesn't name him in the in the corporate box before the, before the game. He'd been mm. to the team hotel. You can almost, I, I can't do a South African accent, so I'm not going to try, but he said, you know, he said to him, Give I promise try. you, the boys are effing up for this. Um, and they were, and they tore into Ireland. I mean, I was talking to Brendan Moran from Sportsfile as I was leaving last night. He said the sound of the collisions on the pitch was just breathtaking. You know, the, 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 you could, the even in the full right stadium, the they're right it, up, yeah, yeah, we're miles away up the top. <laughs> um, and they heard, you know, the, it wasn't just it wasn't just the visual, it was the, 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 
the thundering nature of it, and and you can imagine that. So it was um, they threw everything at Ireland. Thought Peter Stafftoa just or the toy. He was just, like, everything he hit was just laced with venom. It was ridiculous. Sexton got nailed about four or five times just on that line. They're brilliant at it. That line where he just delivered the pass. It's not quite late, you know. It's not late enough to be against the rules, but it's late enough to leave Sexton in a heap on the ground. And Ireland found a way. You know, I thought I, I thought at six all at half time, I, and with Furlong Murray and Murray turned out to be blessing the skies really, but. Um, and McCluskey in particular going off I really feared for Ireland in that second half and they proved me wrong you know a lot of stuff that I've been questioning in, in here and in the paper that I worried about this Irish pack they proved me wrong and that's 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 a great thing for them to be able, not that that's the important part but like you know they, they've there's a lot less doubts about this Ireland team now than there was you know at 5.30 yesterday Can I show you how uh, life's all about opinions? Hmm. <laughs> uh, Neil Francis this was no thriller. This is the point about the quality. This yeah. was no thriller because he had opened by uh, referencing thriller in Manila. And if anybody says that this was a match for the purist, then they are sadly mistaken. I'll flick over to Bernard Jackman. At halftime, the score was six points apiece. One of the most entertaining 12-point halves I've watched. It was one for the purists, I admit, but the level of physicality in cat and mouse that we witnessed was right at the highest level of the game. So we have Neil Francis saying Neil the Francis says quality were- wasn't good. Bernard Jackman thought it was Neil great. Francis says the box kicking from all the halfbacks was pub team standard. Well, it <laughs> wasn't a good day for kickers, <laughs> to be fair. I'm with they, them they got, the like, they, they got their selection of 10 wrong. Yeah. Their attack still leaves an awful lot to be desired. I mean, there was a couple of times in that second half where there was they had overlaps and rather than give the pass, they tucked and ran and it was criminal. But, I mean, he has a line in it and, like, Neil Francis is an international second row himself and he says that Etzebeth and Diager are a long way short of the class of Bucky, Bucky's boat and Victor Matfield. The publicity machine tells us that these guys are superstars, but the evidence suggests otherwise. Yeah. I'm sorry, doesn't it, he's obviously forgotten about the World Cup final where they mm. absolutely like monstered the England pack. The England pack that had monstered Ireland a couple twice in the previous year had just destroyed New Zealand the week previously. Like That was one of the greatest four-pack performances. I was there... I'll, I'll never forget the way they ground England at the submission that day. Mm. Look, this wasn't a World Cup final. I think they'll be better in ten months' time. Yeah. But to say that they're not that, that they're bang average is just—I think that's wrong. I mean, that that's about is a phenomenal player. He might not be the most visionary. I mean, he threw an unbelievable offload oh, for the Renzi try. Amazing, like they yeah. show what they can do in the end, but um, I think that's unfair. I think that, well, that diminishes even, what um, he won't mind me saying it, but even. During the match, I think at least three times, Rob Carney almost talking to himself in the studio said, "It's a bet incredible." Yeah, yeah. He did, yeah. that was fantastic. He didn't, I don't think he got a chance at full time to mention it. But so, are you more in the? Because it is. I mean, it's just so stark and interesting. But that Francis's point as well, Joe, is he, he's whichever you could see last night was they didn't have a kicker that they're missing Andrew Pollard, and yeah. that was a big factor. I mean, they left seven points at least, mm. and they are more behind well, him. To be and, fair, and some awful, awful even even uh, touchline kicking. Him and Bernard Jackman agree on that point because. Yeah. Bernard Jackman does make the point the next time this is going to be in a neutral venue they will have a goal kicker and they will have someone who can play the percentages at 10 so that will strengthen them but I'm, I'm curious Rory do you are you uh, more in the Francis camp where you, he says this was a match of low quality no. and there were players out there who were so far out of their depth it was embarrassing or Bernard Jackman who was saying the level of physicality the cat and mouse was right at the highest level of the game. Like, they're two... I thought it was a very right high... at the end of this I thought it was a very high-quality game. I mean, Frano has a cut-off Robert Balakun. Um, he has a history of going after Ulster wingers. He didn't... You know, it turned out pretty well for Tommy Bow, who he gave zero out of ten in the player ratings at the start of his career. Um, look, Philemsa was out, was a wrong call and was the worst player in the pitch and, and mm-hmm. arguably cost South Africa the game, having not having a goal kicker. Like, when LaRue came on in the second half, he made an awful difference. But just because Ireland neutralised South Africa doesn't make South Africa a bad team. I think the achievement of Ireland neutralising the mall and the scrum mm. can't be. The, you can't just say then turn around and say, "Oh, they're, they're, these are not good." Like they are the world champions. That they base. It was basically the pack that won the World Cup. So I, I think that's very unfair on what Ireland achieved yesterday. Um, I suppose what you could say is that the, the long, the length of the first half, the number of stoppages, it wasn't as flowing as, say, the New Zealand test, but that was never going to be that kind of game. This was quality in a different way. Um, this was Ireland finding ways to beat a team that can squeeze you and squeeze the life, you know, squeeze the life out of you until you've nothing left. So I, I think Neil Francis is being quite unfair on them. I think Bernard Jackman is closer to the mark. Um, certainly my sense in the ground was that it was a high-quality test match. 
albeit South Africa just found different ways to, to butcher opportunities in the second half. And yeah. Ireland, part, that was partly Ireland's defence and partly their own limitations because if they can't beat you up, they don't seem to be able to find a second way, whereas Ireland are finding different ways to beat teams. Clean it. Sorry. Just, just, just on the... On the, on the brokenness of the play if you like and the physicality was yeah. you know and it's something Ollie Holt um, refers to today as well in relation to um, Owen Farrell but um, uh, Shane McGrath makes a good point he, he said the 57 minutes the first half was 57 minutes long it's standard just, these days just shows you though doesn't it like the yeah. level of physicality there was at one point there was was there four four people being treated at one point at yeah. the same time yeah and, and there's length, there's lengthy TMO, you know, that they took a long look at that um, Colby incident before yeah. coming to a decision. But also just these water breaks, which nobody needs or wants. Yeah, and it's all to do with Razzy Erasmus and, and what happened in the 20, 21 Lions tour, but it's like they've come up with a terrible solution to a problem. Yeah. Um, that's just like, yeah, it's making the game harder, harder to watch. And then it's bringing in these kind of musical interludes in the stadium that have been such a feature this week. Um, <laughs> that again, just don't work for me personally, but it, it was. Uh, it still, even though it was long and it was, I, I found st- I, that was it was good enough to be compelling. Like it, 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 the good outweighed the bad. But there's still a lot for Ruby to, to to fix there. And this is the cosmetic stuff. This isn't going into the deeper stuff about concussion and subconcussive hits and all that stuff. That's you know you watch that physicality and you're like, God, this is this safe? You know. Well, that was the question I was going to ask. Given what we know about the game and the um, price that players are paying. And even around the game, we glorified the physicality. It was the talking point all week. When you watch it now, Kleena, does I, part I, of you I, fail I do, to yeah, get... Yeah, no, I do. I cringe now, you yeah. know, I do. It's and, not and thrilling, it's more... I do, I, yeah, I do. I, I, more and more, particularly the head stuff, and whether it's accidental or not, and even that contentious spirit, not spirit tackle, not a spirit tackle, yellow, red card, whatever it was, you know, you just, you do cringe just because of the pure size and speed that these people can travel at. Yeah. That's the thing, like the impact, and, and all the statistics are, you know, the, uh, the statistics are very often it's the uh, tackler that's the one who gets the worst injuries, but Ollie Holt raises it as well, just in his, you know, general column today in the mail, and he's talking about, um, you know, after Dylan Hartley's piece last week about yeah. worrying about dementia, that he said, you know, the news that Owen Farrell had been drafted back into the England team that plays Argentina today a fortnight after suffering what was described as a brutal knockout playing for Saracens. Like that, he's saying, there's no protocols broken there, but, you know, that doesn't mean the guy, you know, is right to be playing at this stage. Um, and he said, how many similar injuries has the England captain suffered? I don't know, but I do know he's storing up trouble for himself. Now, that's his, he, obviously his opinion, but you do worry about, you know, this level. And it's funny, um, the the captain of of, uh, of the Athlone women's team playing today, Laurie, um, he was a former Clare footballer, and she's playing the FAI Cup final today. But, like, I, I was talking to her during the week about her and just, you know, concussion that she suffered and how bad she was and incredible she had she went to a physiotherapist and I said how could you go to a physiotherapist for a concussion and she was saying it was literally making my eyes move left to right left to right you know spent three or four months had to sleep in darkened rooms all those things you know and it's happening in all sports but I just think rugby at the moment you do you do I just feel I don't you know before I used to you know we're in years back before we knew all this stuff you know you would you would love to see those physical hits and now I kind of do wince when I see them and in some respects, the game at large was, as a spectacle, was lucky because last night wasn't littered with head collisions. One, no. one yeah. out, I was just trying to think, no. it yeah. came off yeah. with HIA. It would be attritional and we saw yeah. injuries, Shoulders. but they, they weren't the injuries of players having to get HIAs, oh, which yeah. it could easily have been. The three Ireland injuries, I mean, Stuart McCluskey fell awkwardly on his wrist. Yeah. Conor Murray pulled his calf yeah. as he went, or sorry, yeah. his groin, groin as he went think, through, yeah. and um, Ty Furlan rolled an ankle. So they're not deeply attritional injuries. So, no. I mean, these players were able to get through the 80 minutes without actually... You know, there was no collision injuries really, but yeah. the, the toll, it's the toll that it's taken on them. I mean, the fact that you're legally allowed to hit Sexton just after he's delivered a pass. And now Sexton brings that on and what makes him great is the fact that he delays his pass so late that he commits man. the defender. Yeah. But there, you know, some of those hits that he took were absolutely ferocious, but they were within the laws of the game. And they are, I'm torn on it, you know, I, I can see the danger, but I also relish the spectacle. And that's that's the eternal... You know, you're doing a deal with the devil, I suppose, and that's what it is part of what makes the the, the, the test rugby in particular so enthralling. 
Keenan, um, Keenan got a bad hit as well at one stage and just hopped yeah. up. I mean, their resilience is extraordinary. And they're, they're in incredible well. condition. It's just they yeah. can't they can't protect. You know, they, the one thing they can't protect is their brains, in and that's s- well, in that's some the ways, concern. I, yeah, in some ways, I thought well. As, that was as attritional as it gets yesterday and yet it was quite positive that there weren't a bunch of head hits or high shots that maybe, well, look, this game's always going to, I think, have a de- an inevitable degree of danger and there's going to have to be informed consent with future generations. But I did watch yesterday and think, well, that couldn't have been more hotly contested, couldn't have been more physical and yet we managed to avoid head hits. So that was encouraging. Well, I mean, teams are going to, like, we're, we're, we're just asking teams to, like, learn that you can't, like, by regulating it, by re- sending people off for it and Ireland have had Peter Armani, Bunnicky, twice sent off for head-high shots in the yeah. last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, they cost them a game over in Wales a couple of years ago. It cost England the Six Nations game last year. I mean, teams have to learn and adjust. And I think Ireland and the Leinster, like Leinster have a contact skills coach and Sean O'Brien. Before him, Dennis Neamey did that job and Hugh Hogan. And he has put incredible effort into working with the, tackle, the tackler to make the tackler a, a better at going lower. And Josh van der Fleer is an unbelievable example of that. Will Connors who is currently out injured, um, but he's a brilliant low tackler. Ireland's tackle technique is probably world leading and they don't get themselves in those positions as often as other and teams. Sexton, and Sexton's I mean, tackling has changed as well. It has, yeah, yeah, but they go lower. They tend not, because they know it's not necessarily about safety, it's about discipline and trying not to get sent off because you don't want to cost your team. And yeah. look at the summer when New Zealand had had players sent off for high-high shots in the, in, the, in the test series. That They were really important moments and they were just clumsy um, you know, going into contact too high. That doesn't happen as much with Ireland. And in fairness, South Africa, they are massive men, but they're and, and they don't get enough credit for this. They're technically excellent in a lot of what they do. Mm. Um, and while they bring in an unbelievable level of force and and aggression to it, it's within the they bring, keep it within the bounds of, and that's what makes them so effective and so good. And that's why I think you know France is quite unfair on them earlier on. You know, Rory Keane cleaner says the hype machine will now go into overdrive. Um, <laughs> but Johnny Sexton uh, afterwards and across the papers uh, on all the front pages, he's he's urging caution. We're building well, but we have to win trophies. Triple crown pleasing, but it's about championships, Six Nations, Grand Slams, World Cups. We've done nothing really, so you ca- can't compare this to Ireland teams that have won before. The other thing he did say, though, which jumped out to me, is on the front page here of the Sunday Independent. He said, we probably didn't play our best rugby, but that's also a very pleasing thing because maybe a couple of years ago, we would have crumbled or not shown the guts that we did there. So that was very pleasing. Yeah, they, 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 a big well, admission, isn't it? A, a couple we, of years well, ago, we wouldn't have shown the guts. Yeah, well, Sexton does that. Sometimes Sexton comes out with stuff and it kind of slides past you. And I'd you say this is former teammates going, what? <laughs> exactly, yeah. But he's like, what I what I think he's right about is that, is that just they stuck in, they stuck in, they stayed there, they stayed there, they stayed yeah. there, you know, and they and he made some very brave decisions himself as well. But they didn't, they didn't crumble. I, Roy Keane's piece, I think, is good as well because. Um, he just looks. He just talks about how they changed, how they played as well. So you know they had to combine a bit of both. They had to bish bash up up the middle, yeah. but they put more width on it, and they were willing to push them around and see. But it was just their ability to withstand what they did in the first half, even that early. You know, just defending their line for so long. Like well, it was fifty remarkable. tackles in the yeah, first fifteen it minutes. Was some 49 yeah. well, not seventy of them it was ridiculous. Um, yeah. stand on their own line where South that Africa was, that was incredible. went brute yeah. force and ignorance. Like they yeah. didn't. They were there was no tip on passes. There was no out the back. It was just carry, carry, carry. Actually, Peter stepped to talk through a little a little tip on, and that actually opened up Ireland a little bit. They won a penalty. They scored. They made a three all. That it was, was only the, a penalty. It was only a penalty. <laughs> exactly. That was that, but that was. It, I thought that's what I. That's where I had the fear was that this was going to take a toll that, that they would take the legs from Ireland but Ireland's fitness paid and, and I, the bench, I, the bench, and the bench but I think like, you've got to take you know Aki and Henshaw are Ireland's first choice 12s McCluskey's only won six caps across seven years yeah. um, he's playing well you know, he's Ireland's third choice 12 he's playing well he gets whipped off Jimmy with the Brian injury Jimmy O'Brien comes on he's never played for Ireland before he's playing a 13 he's not a 13 position. Ring yeah. Rose is playing a 12 they never missed a beat like that's you know, Ireland's depth was pretty much exposed on Friday night you know in that All Blacks A game but they were still the, the the first team are adaptable and resilient enough to over like other Irish teams would have folded in that you know weren't weren't able to cope with that kind of adversity. You know, and Jameson like, Gibson Park just Gibson Park totally changed yeah, the pace yeah, of the game yeah. too when he came in and 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 you could see that South Africa were getting tired at that stage. Yeah, you know yeah. they had put so much effort in and hadn't got the return and they were the ones then who mentally crumbled. I thought it was a really absorbing game. Oh, I have yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to what extent does this then allay the fear or the accusation that Ireland can't handle big teams? Mostly, largely. Well, they can. 
they they, they've shown now that they've they've they, like the, look, they could play South Africa next Saturday and get beaten up, but I think any team could be beaten up by South Africa. But they've shown that they can handle them all. They've shown that even their bench, who they're much maligned, Finley Bealham comes on and, and does forty minutes, and I think mm. his, I think you know he deserves an awful lot of praise for how he performed. Rob Herring as well, even Keane Healy came on for the last 10, 15 minutes, and and like I mean, this day, he's held together at this stage, and he's able to come on in a test match and, and hold his own. Um, I, I like I, France is the next big test of that, and England maybe at home as well. But France are up first in the Six Nations, and 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 France have a, a certain set of skills that again. Ireland will have to be clever to come up to, to negate because they have a, another 130-odd kilo lock and a 130-odd kilo um, tight head prop. And when they get them together, and they maw, and you know it's quite hard to deal with. And Ireland just don't have the, that cattle. Mm. But they have shown a way. They've, they've dealt with the box, and that's, that's the ultimate test in my book. So they've answered that question. 